Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. NWA World Championship Wrestling, February 6th, 1988. The show opened with clips of the bench press contest between the Road Warriors and as they would finally be named on the show, the Powers of Pain. And there's... This is the you know, the prelims, so they're just warming up with 135. Two 45-pound plates in the bar. But they were all very serious about this. This this was no uh, day at the beach, to coin a phrase. This was, this was a serious, legitimate athletic contest, and winning was very important. Partly for the money, but more for the pride. You know, we'll get into the bench press contest more after a while, but I couldn't help but notice that, especially as, as we actually saw the full footage, the fans are not only patiently watching four large men lift weights, but they're so invested in it. And I'm just trying to imagine. I mean, maybe it would work if you had the right guys today, but I'm just trying to imagine a segment on Raw, like the stuff with Bobby Lashley and Sami Zayn, where Bobby Lashley was going through the obstacle course, and, you know, the fans sort of got into that, but nothing like this bench press contest. I'm just trying to imagine a bench press contest on Raw. I don't even know who he would have in it. Strowman, I guess. Strowman and Brock. Strowman, Strowman and Brock. It'd be an awesome bench press contest. It's actually a fascinating question. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure Strowman would win a bench press contest, but it'd be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. So the announcers were talking about this bench press competition. They said nothing had been proven, but there had been a very serious injury. Jim Ross went so far as to call it tragic. <laughs> and it's funny because we see the footage later, and as we'll, we'll get to it. I don't want to spoil it for all the listeners as we build it up here, but in hindsight, boy, did these announcers downplay this at the start of the show. They very, <laughs> very calmly explained to us, you know, nothing was settled. I'm like... There, there was an injury. <laughs> there was, a, there, there was the, an injury. And... The way they talk about it here, you think, oh, a guy must have, like pull, pulled a bicep or something. Sure, someone <laughs> tore a peck, bench pressing. Yeah, that could happen. Strained muscle, he'll probably need some massage and take a week off. Larry Zabisco versus Larry Stevens. Have we talked lately about how awesome Larry Zabisco was on these shows? Yeah, he's great. He got more out of two headlocks than I've seen in I don't know how long. He put a headlock on the guy, and the guy couldn't get out, but then the guy put the headlock on him, and Zabisco couldn't get out, and they got minutes out of this, and it was awesome. So, Larry... Zabisco defeated Barry Windham for the Western States Heritage Wrestling Championship. And so Windham, now trying to get his title back, is out here scouting Larry. But he's not out there to be a distraction or to make a spectacle of himself. He comes out. He, like, pokes his head around the corner. They don't even show him on camera for a long time. He's not out there to distract Zabisco. He is out there to scout his future opponent. Eventually, Zabisco and Baby Doll spot him, and they point and they shout some things, and eventually the camera cuts over to him, and just standing over in the shadows, just standing there, and the match continues, and eventually Larry beats Larry with the rolling neck breaker. They couldn't find another jobber not named Larry for Larry I Zabisco recall, here. I seem to recall this has happened before. Yeah, I don't know why. How many multiple Larrys they have? I mean, we couldn't have had Sting versus Larry Stevens and Larry Zabisco versus David Isley that just... It, once that once that format is made, there there's no change in things. <laughs> it's, it's an ink. All I know is this. We do talk about Larry Z often and how awesome he is, but Larry Zabisco has a reputation for being a a staller. Yes. Like, that's all everyone talks about is, oh, Larry Z just stalled and he stalled and he stalled. Listen, dude was awesome. I don't know. I don't know how he got this reputation. Yeah, he does stall a lot, but he's a fantastic wrestler. Yeah. He's unbelievably great. He stalls a lot, and as far as I can tell, it works. It does work. That's the it point. A, a big reaction. There's the goal. So good on him. And then when he does start wrestling, it's awesome. So he did a promo with David Crockett, who asked... <laughs> David Crockett's a courageous man. He asked Larry Zabisco, how does it feel to stand behind a woman who won that title for you? I thought Larry was going to punch him right in the face. <laughs> Larry says he'd always had the talent to succeed. He just needed the secrets in the competition that Baby Doll had. He knew that Barry Windham wanted a rematch for the prestigious Western States Heritage Championship belt, but he was done wasting time on Windham. Now he's moving on up the stairway to heaven to Dusty Rhodes and that U.S. title. And he ran down Dusty and his fans for a bit, and it was great. 
So we have we have great wrestler. We have great promo. Mm-hmm. Anything else we can add to Larry's list of accolades? Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I was he a competent announcer at times? Hey, he was, yeah, he, he had his ups and downs. He had his moments. Yeah. He had great days, I'll say yeah, that. He had too much of an ego to be a good commentator. He he was a great speaker. <laughs> just, he, he, he was he a great himself, orator. He got himself over very well as a commentator calling other people's matches. Yes. Sting versus David Isley. I don't know what the hell was up with Sting's music this week. Oh my god, they had this they had this weird funky surfer like, music. Southern blues rock. It was so great. Like <laughs> I want to watch I, more Sting matches to hear this fake music that they're piping in for the guy. I'm not sure if this was fake. I think this may have something that he actually had for uh, at the time. Okay, somebody let me know if this was actually Sting's music in because 1988 cuz it's it's astonishing. The, if you pay attention you can tell uh they they are very very good at editing in out the old music and putting in the new stuff. But in the Midnight Express, for example, they have to edit in their music. And if you listen to the announcers' voices, they're kind of quieter than they should be. You can tell. But Sting came out here, and this sounded natural and organic. There was so nothing he, natural or organic about this song, Vinny. Uh, fair. <laughs> but, the, but the way it was edited in felt like but it But you know what? Yeah. It was perfect for this absolute weirdo, this crazy man. This this young buck. You know, I was thinking about this here, watching Sting, and uh, you know, they're, they're, Sting broke in and teamed for a few years with a guy who went on to be known as the Ultimate Warrior. Hey, yeah. And one guy had a reputation for being uh, insane, and the other guy had a reputation for being a very good professional wrestler. But you go back and watch this here, young Sting and young Warrior had a lot in common. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, 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 this probably uh, sounds like something... You know, a very obvious statement, but it's true. It, 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 young Sting had a you know he's he would go in there. He didn't know what he was going to do one minute to the next of the match. He would cut his promo. He didn't know what he was going to say one word to the next. He brought back the uh, repetitive splashes spot, which is just awesome. I can't believe nobody's still doing this. He won with the Stinger Splash and the horrendous Scorpion Deathlock, where I think he forgot how to do the move as he was applying it. Then he goes to get a promo. He brags about crashing Ric Flair's party. Said Flair deserved it for having his ceremony while Sting was in the ring trying to take care of business. And he promised to keep crashing parties as long as it took to get to Flair. You know, I I looked it up as you were talking about the match. Sting was 29 years old here, which... That's amazing. I guess kind of blows my mind, because I would have thought that he would be like maybe 23, 24. Yeah. He seemed so young. Yes. And I guess, you know, credit to him... 29 years old, looked a lot younger than he actually was, but his, the thing with Sting was, he was a fairly young, I guess not as young as I thought, he was a fairly young crazy guy whose gimmick was that he was a young crazy guy, (laughs) and not for like one second did I not believe it. You know what I mean? Right. I believe that that's, that's the guy. Yeah, he paints his face up. I'm sure, you know, his name is Steve. And, you know, but that's it. Like, other than him painting his face, I, I picture that's the way the guy behaves at the supermarket. That's the way the guy behaves when he goes to buy a car. Just a young, crazy guy. A cool guy to get behind. He's he's completely eclipsed Luger, who was who was so over just a couple of months ago. He's he's eclipsed, like, all of the other baby faces. He's clearly their number one guy right now. Mm-hmm. Ole Anderson came out for a promo. It was much better than last week. Oh, it was a million times better. He only talked for like two minutes instead of 30. And he had a point, and he got to it. Uh, The point is, he's got a Valentine's Day tag match between himself and Luger against Tully and Arn. He says it's going to be a cage match. He started off very calm and rational, and even said, the Andersons don't need to come out here and yell and scream to make our point. But then the more he talking he did, the more riled up he got, and by the end, he was, in fact, yelling and screaming. You're going to be in that cage match. You're going to have no choice but to bleed like a stuck pig. We're going to turn you into pieces of hamburger. And then when we're done, I'm going to take that snot-nosed punk, as you called him, and we're going to see what he can do to you. So yeah, the, the, the tease is, go to the Omni to watch Oli and Lex beat Tully and Arn, and then Oli Jr. will whip some ass. Yeah, I love when he goes, I'm going to have a surprise. And the surprise is, I'm bringing my snot-nosed kid. I'm like, hell of a surprise, Oli. You gave it away. It was a surprise for three seconds. It's no longer a surprise, dude. No. 
the secrets out. Tim Horner versus Gladiator number one. Boring. So Tim is doing arm bars for seven or eight minutes, and the announcers are talking about the Rock and Roll Express and the sheep herders, anything else they can think of to keep themselves awake. And finally, they are run out of other topics, and there's a pause, and Tony just says, Still with that arm now, Tim Horner. <laughs> And Horner finally won with an O'Connor roll. Dude, it's just... Tim Horner is a 1980s white meat technical wrestling babyface. So I guess this is what we have to put up with. Literally, he would give... He would actually give Gladiator some spots. Gladiator would do this, but then he'd cut him off and go back to the arm. And he'd give Gladiator something and he'd cut him off and he'd go back to the arm. I will give them credit. There was a hilarious ass bump for an atomic drop. That's the only good thing I can say about this match. And I was I was putting my finger on the button to fast forward, and he got a rolling reverse cradle for the pin. Not everything was better in the 80s. This match <laughs> died a death, and it sucked. So the announcers are talking about the bench press competition. A capacity crowd in Greensboro to see this. And they said, we're going to join this contest in progress. Because it's important to note that live, this took up a fair amount of time. I just love the idea that we're joining a tape segment in progress. Well, <laughs> that's yeah. not what that means. <laughs> they could have said, we'll go to the end and show you what happened, but that's not what they Yeah, said. let's go to the good stuff. So, I mean, this had to be near the end, right? Clearly. Well, we, we, but I mean, it had to end. also be near the beginning. Uh, I don't think they started with 145, then did 165, and then did one. I mean, they had to I would, just I would warm assume, up and then here we go. I would assume they probably started at like 300 and he moved up. And well, the first thing we saw them do was 475 pounds. Well, so maybe, it's funny you should mention that. Mm-hmm. So they have this bench. Did you count the weights? I did count the weights. Okay. Because they've got the weights on the bar and they announce that the animal is going to go first and he's going to bench press 470 pounds. I was like, hold on a second. There's three. There's three 45s on each side, and what appears to be, I guess, maybe a 25, okay? Okay. Maybe I, maybe I thought it was a 10. But anyway, I added it all up, and it looked like about 320 pounds. So I they thought... wide. lied. I thought, okay, well, maybe, because two of the plates, the two plates that, that were closest to the inside, looked a little bit different, and I thought, well, maybe let's pretend that those are 100 pounds, all right. Even though I've never seen a 100-pound plate, and it was exactly as thick I, I, as the 45-pound plate. Okay, well, yeah, they, they're, they're thicker, but I have seen them. <laughs> yeah, but like... Because so anyway, they weigh twice as much. <laughs> even adding those up, I could only come up with 430. Okay. So they're claiming... And then, the funny thing is, Animal goes, and they're claiming 470, but it looks like 320. And then Barbarian goes, but now Tony's claiming it's actually 475 pounds. So nobody even knew what these numbers were. I'm pretty sure they said 475 every time. Okay. But. Well, anyway, the point is, I, they were they were very clearly fudging these weights, but uh, they were yeah. using real plates. It wasn't like they were using fake plates. Right. These were like real metal heavy plates. They just weren't putting very many on, and I guess they figured the fans were, you know, too stupid to add. And based on the reaction, I guess they were right. Yes. Or maybe fans just maybe these fans had never been to a gym. They didn't know. Anyway, so allegedly they had 475 pounds in the bar. Animal did it very easily. And, and I mean easily, just, for, you know, he picks the weight up, drops it down, pushes it up, sets it back. And Jones just says, I could see animal straining. They're, we're getting to these world warriors. Barbarian, go lift this weight. And, of course, you know, it's, Barbarian has to lift this to match it. And he is, it's not a struggle, but it's not quite as easy for Bar- Barbarian as it was for Animal. But he gets it up, and Paul Jones is so happy. His team is, his team is still alive. So the way this works, apparently, is they keep adding weight, and each team then picks one guy to go do that weight. So you can take turns. Uh, you don't want to wear out your, your bigger guy. So you need your smaller guy to lift as much as he can, as often as he can, to save the big guy for the bigger weights at the end. So they're about to load up to 500 pounds. Paul Jones is there with a pad and a pen. He is taking furious notes. I can only imagine the strategy the give and take going on in his head, the moving pieces, the spinning gears, as he formulates the strategy about doing a goddamn bench press. So the road warriors have a huddle, and they say, listen, screw this 500 pounds, let's go ahead and jump this up to 600 pounds. And Jones is having none of it, so Ellering steps up. 
he cuts this promo in Joan's face. Now, keep in mind, like we say, this is the end. This had been going on for several minutes. They did warm-ups with all four guys for a few minutes. I'm sure they had to take time to wheel all this equipment out and set it up. So I bet in the, in the arena, I'm sure this had gone at least 50 minutes here, maybe even like 20 by now. So Ellering says, listen, let's stop wasting these people's time. Let's give them what they want. Let's do 600 pounds right now. And Paul Jones calmly says, this is my contest. I say we're doing 500 pounds. You, Paul Ellering, should go pray for your men. So Ellering slaps him. A melee breaks out. And in all the hysteria, all the chaos, Jones accepts this challenge. And they go up to 600 pounds. And they load up this big-ass heavy bench press bar. Animal is getting ready. He's psyching himself up. He's slapping himself. He's roaring. They're hawking the Ellering. They're screaming at him. You've done this before. And he goes to lie down on the bench, and Hawk's behind him there to spot him. And as soon as Animal lies well, down... Well, before that, before that, Animal's about to get on, and then he demands 6'10". He's Aha! going 10 pounds heavier. And like I said earlier, the fans are going crazy. That's Animal right. is... He's putting chalk on his hands. He's clapping his hands, and, and chalk flies up in the air. And he's getting all fired up. The fans are going absolutely crazy like... Dusty Rhodes is about to win the world title from Ric Flair. They're going so crazy for this bench press contest. And he lays down and he's ready to go. And Hawk's behind him. Hawk's ready to, to, to spot him and get him off this, this bar. And then Ivan Koloff grabs that box of chalk and throws it in Hawk's eyes. And Hawk goes down. And Ivan and Barbarian and Warlord all jump on Animal, start beating him up. They take out Ellering. And the, the biggest spot, Warlord takes Animal and he rams Animal's head into the weights on one side of the bar. Oh, man, he rams his head so hard that the whole bench tips over, Yeah, and this alleged 610 pounds falls on the ground and starts rolling away. Yeah, like like you said, this probably was not legit 600 pounds, but it was several hundred pounds, and it was, you know, the way it was set up on the bench press rack was you only had to push it over a little bit, because the bench press rack is not meant to be tipped over, everyone. No, so usually a bad thing. Once it gets just a little bit tipped over, the weight will take it down. The bench goes flying up in the air. So there's the, the beating continues. Jones grabs the bag of money. He says, this is my bag of money. My team is the strongest. We proved it to the fans, and we damn sure proved it to these road warriors. And he and his men leave, and Hawk is down, covered in chalk. Ellering's down, basically under the ring. Animal's down, bleeding. Carnage and devastation out of this Bench press contest. You know, there's so many things that get built up in any in any professional wrestling promotion. And, you know, sometimes it's a big time letdown, like that first AJ Nakamura match at WrestleMania. Sometimes like this Omega Okada, it's it, it exceeds expectations, no matter how high the expectations were. This falls into the latter category. I was excited to see, I was so excited to see the bench press contest. I I figured that something like this would happen. I didn't know exactly what happened. I knew obviously that Ellering and his crew were going to do something dastardly in the middle of the contest, but I figured it would just be like, you know, the heels push the weight down and crush the baby face's chest or something like that. This was so much better than I could have imagined. I, I didn't even really think it was going to be like in front of the people. Like, I, I, I don't know what I thought. I mean, I guess it had to be in front of the people, but the crowd reaction, the angle, the everyone's everybody's roll, animal firing himself up, and Koloff being so dastardly, and and you know Paul Jones grabbing that money and and claiming that they'd won the bench press contest because they threw like chalk in the other guy. It was so wonderful. It was everything that I could have wanted and more. This, I think, was the first thing. On these retro Saturday night reviews we've been doing for what three years now, two or three years. This is the first thing where I remembered in detail. Uh, well, it's funny you should mention that because Lance on Twitter noted this was the first NWA show that he ever watched. This one yes. right here with the bench press contest. And in related news, Lance was a huge Road Warriors fan. As a That's kid. right. I can't imagine why. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so for for me, there was a, I, it was not a surprise because I knew at, at least how it, how it ended. I don't know if I remembered every detail up to that point. But uh, it was very effective, I can say that. So they go back to the studios. And Ross says, Animal suffered severe damage in this attack. A cracked orbital bone, nerve damage, 
and his eye had been pushed back by a quarter inch. Oh, that's the worst. He repeated over and over, just in case you missed it or did not understand the first time, animal's face had been pushed into a 600-pound weight so hard that the 600-pound weight went flying. It was like, he said, dropping a 600-pound weight on your face. <laughs> hey. That's all funny and all, but like, if I throw your face into a 600-pound weight bench, mm -hmm. and it hits it hard enough to knock the weights over, I mean, what if I threw your head into a concrete wall that didn't move? Like, is are they not both equally terrible? His physics was terrible. <laughs> it's, I, I, it, it, it's true. But it made for a great story. And, and he sure, mentioned sure. optical nerve damage. He was hospitalized. He had to undergo surgery. He says, I know, fans, the road warriors look invincible, but they are human. That's right. I was like, oh, God. So they go to break, and they come back. And we're still on the same point here. Ross says animals facing surgery. And he makes it clear, ladies and gentlemen, the road warriors are in a position we've never seen them in before. And we go back to the arena where Hawk has recovered, Ellering has recovered. There's a bunch of geeks out there and animals being put on a backboard and let it loaded onto a stretcher. And they were not fucking around with this. This is not to the back. And, and it wasn't breaking news at this point either because it clearly was not live. They just showed for like five or six minutes animal being loaded onto a stretcher. And then wheel to the back of the building. That's right. People applauded. So finally they go back to the studio. And now Jones and his crew are out there. Now we have had a lot of fun at Paul Jones' expense in the past. And I'm sure we will in the future as well. But for one night here in February of 1988, Paul Jones was awesome. <laughs> he, was, he was awesome, but I mean, I love the line... You know something? Let me tell you something. Well, you know how many times he said that in this promo? A bunch, yeah. <laughs> He's, he was very excited, Brian. He was he was he, very, very excited. Struggling to, to restrain his enthusiasm to make his point. He dubbed his crew the powers of pain here. And if you don't believe that name, go watch Animal get rolled out again. His men had won the bench press competition fair and square. He still had his money. He dared the Warriors to come get it. I believe... I mean, I'm pretty sure this is what happened, but you wouldn't know from listening to him. I believe he challenged them to a ladder match. Yes. Where they don't hang the money from the ceiling. There's a ladder, and the money is on top of the ladder. Now, why you can't just tip the goddamn ladder over and get the money? I have no idea. But like, I, that, that was apparently the rules. He may have skipped over the detail of the bag of money being suspended over the ring. But he challenged them to a ladder match. He plugged a six-man... Uh, championship match in Philadelphia between Dusty and the Warriors defending against the Powers and Ivan. He said, finally, finally, the Road Warriors have met someone who could physically manhandle them. And they don't know how to handle it. He Look said, at that scene, he said. Yes, it looks like somebody threw a hand grenade. Yes. I was like, kind of did, actually. That was a good visual. Bodies were everywhere, and it had to be the most embarrassing time of the Road Warriors' lives. He turns to Ivan, and he says, thank you, Ivan, for getting my men in shape and preparing them mentally for the contest. And then Ivan takes this whole thing, which had been great anyway, and he cranks it up several degrees. He says, you see what happened? Animal had tried to lift 600 pounds, but he dropped it. And that is why the weight fell over. And as for Hawk, Hawk was so nervous that at the end of the evening, he just had chalk all over his body. And then he cackled. <laughs> and as he's cackling... Jones cranks it up several hundred degrees. Losers! Losers! That's all they are is losers! And it fades to black. This was awesome. This was absolutely phenomenal. Unbelievably great. Between the bench press contest, the Jim Ross update, the interview with Paul Jones, just a great line by Ivan. He's so nervous, his hands were just sweating. And by the end of the contest, he was covered in chalk. Ha <laughs> ha! They all howl. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. And then, and then, you think the show can't get any better. Who is next but Dick Murdoch facing some geek? Bob Emery, who had a very good physique and a very bad headlock. So they brawl outside right away. Emery goes flying into the podium. It's Actually, before that, dude, before they even went to the podium, I don't know what got into Dick Murdoch, but he decided, I'm going to give Bob Emery a headlock. 
and I'm not going to be able to get out. And he's struggling and struggling and struggling, and Bob Emery keeps getting his headlock back, and finally, Dick Murdoch can take no more. And he takes him outside, throws him through the podium, and completely destroys it. So the podium is in ruins, okay? Jim Ross starts talking about how somebody needs to open up their pocketbook. He starts talking about Ted Turner. Because Ted Turner eventually, you know, buys this company as it's going out of business. But this is this is early in 1988. So he's already getting involved. I think he was trying to help them with pay-per-view or something like that. But That the, was on TBS. The seeds were being planted. You no, know, he was actually starting to, like, aggressively get in there and try to help this company. I see. Eventually help them by buying them. But anyway. Right. <laughs> so then the announcers are like, oh, we're not going to have a podium for the whole weekend, all the shows this weekend. Murdoch reaches down and he grabs a piece of wood. Actually, it's, be- it's better than that. Cornet tosses it to him. <laughs> he <laughs> he grabs like it. He starts beating on Bob Emery with this piece of wood off of this destroyed podium. And very calmly, Jim Ross goes, has this referee ever heard of a DQ? The exact same Teddy Long that every single week will allow Dick Murdoch. Dick Murdoch could show up with a handgun and start shooting his opponents. And Teddy Long would stand there in the ring and go, Dick, don't you do that. Finally, Jim Ross calls him on. And the One, answer is, two, the three. The answer <laughs> is Teddy Long has not ever heard of a DQ because this also was not a DQ. I just like how Emery goes flying into this uh the, the, this podium. I'm not sure any of this was actually nailed together. I mean, it's just stand wood uh, blocks of wood stacked up like a Jenga tower, just ready to collapse. <laughs> it fell over very easily. And then Murdoch beat him for a while, and it's it's all you know, weapon shots and brawling on the floor. And then Murdoch throws him in. He hits an elbow smash, and he pins him. Not the Brain Buster, or DDT, or Figure Four, or Well, sleeper. dude, he beat the hell out of him with a piece of wood for crying out yeah, loud. What more did too. he need to do? Dude, well, I'm not complaining. I thought it was great. Just Should have gave him a Brain up. Buster on a, on a piece of wood while he was at it. Teddy Long wouldn't have done anything. So Cornette plugs the eight man in Baltimore on the 12th. He's got himself on one side and Misty Blue on the other. And Cornette then... Things they say on TV in uh, 80, 80, was it 87 or 88? 88, 88. That would not fly today. He's talking about the match with Misty Blue, and he verifies that Dick Murdoch will, in fact, with a with Dick Murdoch will hit a woman. I asked his wife, and she said yes. Yeah, it's not going to fly today. No, says he's been training with Richard Simmons. Push yes. ups, sit ups, chin up, pull ups. He always keeps himself in prime physical condition. A personal family friend of the Cornets, Richard Simmons. Yes, he he throws to Dick, and you know. Let, 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 let me. <laughs> He makes it clear all of his men, in fact, will hit a woman. And as for Murdoch, Murdoch will hit a woman, a child, a grizzly bear, or three turtles. And this was clearly news to Murdoch. He was not aware that he was going to be asked to attack three turtles. And he has to count them off on his fingers to make sure he's actually capable of fighting off three turtles. As he's counting them, Cornette says he will drop a brain buster on all of them. <laughs> now I want to see Dick Murdoch brain buster turtles. So Murdoch, he's counting at his fingers... He seems to be in a pretty jovial mood, and so they throw to him, and he's he's back on a scale of 1 to 10. He's a 12 again. And you know what? He, I, I It was different when he was a baby face. When he was a baby face, he was, he was calm, good old boy, just your friendly neighbor inviting you over for a barbecue. He turns heel, and he's just he's insane. And sometimes you hear people say, you know, to be a good promo, you don't want to just go out there and just scream at the top of your lungs the entire time. You want to go out there and you should have your ups and your downs. You want to talk a little bit. You want to have a low voice. You want to have a high voice. You want some modulation or whatever. So, you know, some things are more important than other things. Dick Murdoch is the exception to the rule that proves the rule wrong. He's never below a twelve. He's constantly screaming at the top of his lungs and turning purple. They're the best promos on the entire show. So whoever said you can't just scream all your promos, they never watched Dick Murdoch. He had a line in here where he promised to slap Dusty Rhodes around just like Denver had done to Washington in the Super Bowl. And the announcers thought the same thing I thought, which is that 
he must not have watched the last three quarters of that game <laughs> because Denver jumped out to a lead and then Washington just rolled them for the rest of that game. So, yeah, apparently Murdoch watched the first quarter of the Super Bowl and then I guess got drunk. And Cornet takes off his jacket. He's got a purple shirt on, sweat stains on the armpits. Starts flexing and screaming about his amazing physique. And then he cocks his fist and he screams, No woman in the world can withstand my right hand. And then he howls at how awesome he is. This is when I decided this was the best show we've ever reviewed. (laughs) Because you know that Misty Blue is going to kick his ass and embarrass him in this match. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Of course. Of course. Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson versus Max MacGyver and John Savage. I wrote one sentence. Horseman won quickly with an assisted gourd buster. God, I wrote even less. Arn wins quick, I wrote. And he cut a promo after the break. Arn says anyone can come out there and brag about their drawing power or their amateur credentials. Nobody can say they worked harder than the horseman or smarter than the horseman. That's why all three of them are world champions. Until he says after we beat Lex Luger and Ole Anderson in the, in the Omni, we'll prove we're not such bad guys. We'll give them a job hiring them to clean our Mercedes. Ha, ha, ha. Italian Stallion versus Gene Ligon. Oh, my God. A match that actually happened. It went forever. Like, God bless these guys, but... It wasn't bad. In fact, it was better than the Tim Horner match. Well, yeah, but, I mean, on a show like this where you're on such a high, watching Italian Stallion go for an hour... It was actually... The amazing thing about this match is Italian Stallion does a last ride powerbomb on this guy. In 1988. Not the finish. No. Then he just power slams the guy and wins. That was <laughs> so, the least newsworthy, I guess. The the amazing thing about well, there's actually a lot. There's actually a lot I can say about this for what was a complete nothing match. First of all, I looked it up because they, they were pushing Stallion being the youngster and Ligon being the veteran here. Stallion was 30 years old, so I guess Stallion, like Sting, in the NWA in 1988, 30 was in fact young. So as I am thinking, that your exact same thoughts. Why? At, they did an opening, a house show opening match in the middle of a national wrestling TV show. I'm trying to figure out what's happening and why. And Jim Ross, reading my mind, knowing that 30 years later, I'll be wondering why the hell this match was happening. He is trying to explain there is no championships at stake here, but these men are working very hard to make all the money they can to feed their families. This is a championship match for them. He's trying so hard to make it seem important, and he fails. So they go to the finish. They fuck up an elbow beyond all recognition. And then Ligon whips Stallion into the ropes. He goes like a body slam, but Stallion slips behind and lands on his feet. <laughs> and I have never seen anyone do what Ligon did before. Usually when someone slips behind, you turn around and the guy punches you or rolls you up or there's a clothesline or whatever. Ligon whips his head around. He sees Stallion is now behind him. And then rather than turn around, he whips his head back the way he was facing and runs to hit the ropes. He's got a plan. First of all, it looked like he was scared. Like, he saw Stallion behind him and is now running away. But he runs, he hits the ropes, he goes for a leapfrog or something, and yes, as you know, it is Stallion lifted him high in the air and fucking powerbombed him. And then he picked him up and power slammed him and beat him. A very routine, mundane move. Rick couldn't Steiner's power just, slam was much better. Couldn't just this fucking powerbomb. Power bomb. <laughs> he lifted him up so high, I'm surprised his head didn't hit the lights. It was incredible. It so, was yes. just a move. This whole thing was very, very weird. J.J. Dillon and Ric Flair come out for a promo. I got to talk about J.J., then you can do Flair. All right. He's cutting this promo. He says, you always see Fido the dog chasing these cars and barking. And I always wondered, what would happen if Fido actually got a hold of that car? What would happen if he actually caught up with it? And then he, his voice gets low, and he's, his shoulders come up high, and he starts to giggle and rub his hands together, and he says... That's what's going to happen to Sting. He's so giddy and preposterously overconfident. Of course. I love this act. Of course. And yes, now you know where the Joker got that line in the Dark Knight about chasing a dog chasing cars. He stole it from J.J. Dillon. So Flair, first he talks for a while. About, there, there, there were a bunch of fans there this week. A bunch of adult fans, like a, like a dozen of them. Adult fans who were all wearing sunglasses. They were, they were in everybody, actually. They weren't like booing all the baby faces or anything, but they were very much into Flair. So Flair talks about how these are very intelligent fans. They love him. They love the Horsemen. They love the NWA. Then he turns his attention to Sting. He says, I always, I don't look for easy fights or easy money. I don't fight bums. And Sting, 
You're a bum. You're a young, undertrained punk who's dreaming of being somewhere you're never going to be. And your PC does not like fighting bums, but Sting is one bum he might fight. Someday, he says, he's going to stop the limo and step out and go, woo! And Sting is going to run away like a little dog. Can you imagine he- Ric Flair here saying, someday, one of these days, I'm going to wrestle Sting. I wonder if that match ever happened. <laughs> I, we'll have to find out. No spoilers here on this show. Wait and see, everyone. Wait and see if Ric Flair versus Sting ever actually takes place. He makes fun of Luger for flexing a lot, but not being a very good wrestler. The marquee says wrestling, he says. Not cartoons. Not physique contests. Not pretty faces. Which we all happen to have. He brags again about how they have all three world titles, and he left. This is awesome. Great interview. Lex Luger and Barry Windham versus Tony Suber and Bob Riddle. Barry and Lex beat these guys for a while. Windham pinned Riddle with a lariat. Why didn't to Tony have? Suber? Why wasn't he a bigger star? He he was a pretty. He moved pretty well. He, he was, was a big dude. He was a big guy. Outweighed Luger or Windham. Yeah, Riddle Riddle was hopeless. Couldn't hit the ropes. Tagged in <laughs> just to eat the finish. But nope. Tony Suber looked like he could have been somebody. So they go to cut a promo. Crockett does them the Twin Towers. A name that kind of sort of stuck. So Wyndham goes first. And it's not very good. He calls out the horseman. He calls out Mike Rotundo. And I'm trying to figure out why. Because they haven't had anything to do with each other in months. Literally, it was at this point that he was supposed to talk about the match they have later on this month. Mm -hmm. With Mike Rotundo, a good friend of his. He's going to walk out the winner. But he forgot. And so he throws to Luger. And Luger does his whole promo. And then as they're leaving, Wyndham goes, Oh, you know what? Hold on. I got one more thing I got to say. He challenges Rotundo. Luger was great here. I thought Luger's promo was very good. Came off totally like a main eventer. If you watch Wyndham, you can actually tell Wyndham is impressed with Luger's promo. And then Barry says, yeah, I forgot about Rotundo. He's a good friend of mine because, keep in mind, they had been a tag team at the first WrestleMania. I guess a couple of years before this. But they'd, they'd talked about each other being friends down in Florida for a while. He says they had a match coming up in Atlanta. He did not plan on walking out the loser. Ellering and Hawk come out for a promo. Now, we have talked. El- Ellering just said he vowed Animal would be there to defend the six man titles in Philadelphia. Said $50,000 is a lot of money. It is not worth the cost of a man's eyesight. Now we're out for revenge. Now, we have talked about Hawk promos in the, f- in the past. And so far, they- they've basically been in two categories. They've been very, very weird ones or silly ones, but they're kind of enjoyable for what they are. And when he's tried to cut serious promos, they haven't been as good. This was a serious promo, and it was the bomb. Dude, this was the greatest promo I have ever heard Hawk cut in his entire life. Or Animal or Ellering. And and, and let me think about this. If there ever was a time to cut the best promo of your entire life, now's the time, baby. And he did it. Says the uh, hurting animal is like hurting himself. He's a part of me. I'm a part of him. The biggest mistake you made was not finishing us off. You let us left us alive. We're going to do a lot of Bad things are the powers of pain. We still snack on danger. We'll always dine on death. I wouldn't want to be you guys at all. He said the biggest mistake you ever made is you you didn't you didn't finish the job. You should have killed us. Because you didn't, and now you have to deal with the road warriors. He says, I've got some bad feelings. I got a bad feeling that when this whole thing is done, the Legion of Doom will have done some very bad things. Heaven isn't gonna take us. And hell will be afraid that we'll take over. It was awesome. It was awesome. Just awesome. The Varsity Club versus Andrew Bellamy and Dave Spearman. Okay, so I'll, I'll give it to you that this week I'd say Rotundo was about a five. He's, he's much better now. Mm-hmm. If low bar to jump over. Rick Steiner's out there being crazy. So I know I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but... yes. You're skipping the match entirely. Well, I mean, there's not much to talk about. Steiner got the submission with the oh, I don't know. sugar hold. I thought this match was awesome. Finally. This match ruled. These varsity club guys come out. They've they got the marching band music playing. Sullivan's got them doing up-downs to warm up, and the match begins, and Steiner... The first thing Steiner does is grab a guy and suplex him onto his head. 
He tags in Rotunda. Rotunda comes in and hits a big body slam. He tags a signer. All they would do is power move tag, power move tag, power move tag, power move tag. And finally, Steiner, just, he puts on the fucking sugar hold for the submission. This match ruled. So they go to Sullivan. And Sullivan is talking about how they went rat hunting with spikes. Oh, this is awesome. He's telling this, he's telling this crazy story. And meanwhile, in the background, the... Varsity Club is dancing. No, they're miming. They're chanting Varsity. Yeah. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, we have, this is like everybody remembers the Varsity Club. <laughs> I guess because of what it is. There's a Satan worshiper. Yes. <laughs> in a purple robe. Yes. Who has apparently, I guess, poisoned the minds of two young college athletes. Yes. And he's turning them into spike rat hunting killers. He explained what in the world is <laughs> going for, on for all the training they had done at the University of Syracuse and the University of Michigan, all the days in the gym, all those days in the mats. They never trained like I've got them training. And yes, he took them to the dump, the garbage dump. He gave them spikes in their hands and ordered them to hunt rats with these spikes. And Steiner and Rotunda are smiling, excited. They're giddy with the memory of hunting down rats and stabbing them with these spikes, impaling them on the ground, just like the Wyndhams. They said, "We're gonna get these guys." They're 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 giddy and joyful about this animal cruelty. Steiner makes a joke about Syracuse beating Michigan in basketball. They start shoving each other. Sullivan has to turn around to be be dad and threaten to turn this car around and make peace. He says he's wrestling next. I will show you that evil lives here, and I'm going to destroy Ryan Wagner. Kevin Sullivan versus Ryan Wagner. Kevin Sullivan is a short, very powerfully built man. He's of the weightlifting background who has huge legs. He decided, I shall go out there with my giant legs, national TV, in purple tights. Dude, that's the least of our problems. Yeah. He wears purple. What else do you want him to wear? Trunks. I mean, they're very. And he always very... did. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is it's just it's just so weird. I loved he, it. It's just ridiculous. He destroys Wagner, throws a chair into his face. He's stomping him in the corner. He starts throwing Teddy Long down, and he gets disqualified. So yes, Ryan Wagner has a win over Kevin Sullivan on national TV. And they start all three of them just stomping Wagner to his doom. Finally, Teddy Long has to throw his body on top of the poor man to cover him. And they decide they've had enough and they leave. I love the Varsity Club. I am a huge Varsity Club fan. It's incredibly wacky. It is very, I, very wacky. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why Kevin Sullivan, when he recruited these college athletes, upped his devil worshiping gimmick. <laughs> I don't because know. Because he was out here for months, mostly talking about Dusty Rhodes and speeches that led to nothing. But he was a guy. He was a guy from Boston. Maybe once in a while he'd drop a line about visiting Singapore for some nefarious act. But basically he was a wrestler who talked about wrestling as a sport. And he recruits two very pure wrestlers. Am solid amateur background. But yes, he's worshipping the devil more than ever and apparently is using that evil to influence them. Does it make sense? No. Do I love it? Yes. I gotta talk about the first half of this Sting promo. Because everybody... This is history. It really is. This is the beginning of the Flair Sting rivalry that spanned a generation. And and this everybody, this is how one of the most legendary feuds in the history of professional wrestling began. Sting comes out and he says I embarrassed Flair I'm, I I want to I want to spoil this party again. He says he's the he's the party spoiler. He dares Flair to come out and get in his face. So Flair comes out led by JJ because as normal as usual, JJ is going to do all the talking. JJ barely gets a word out, and Flair just walks right past him. He gets in, in Sting's face. Sting is just deadpan. Keep in mind, this is the crazy guy with the goofy surfer music that does jumping splashes back and forth. It is totally wacky. Well, now the world champion is in his face. He is stone-faced. He's not making a joke of this. He's not smiling. He's not laughing. He's deadly serious. And Flair says, don't you dare come out here and demand 
I come out. I'm going to make the decision to when we're going to wrestle. I'm the world champion. You're a pumped up, overhyped punk from the gym that doesn't know what it's like to wear alligator shoes or ride limousines or have the entire world at his feet. He tells him never to make the mistake of walking out here again, acting like he's been where Flair has been for five years. And then Ric Flair says he buries Sting's parents for not having the brains or the class to even give Sting a name. And then he reaches up and he grabs Sting by the nose. Yeah. He grabs him by the nose like the Three Stooges. Like he's going to pinch his nose between two fingers and then hit his own hand and make a funny noise. This is the beginning of the Flair Sting feud. Flair <laughs> grabbed his nose. <laughs> he did. This is what causes Sting to flip out and attack Ric Flair, and it's on. Why did Ric Flair grab him by the nose? <laughs> You'd have to ask. In the again. entire time <laughs> we have been watching these shows, we've seen Flair feud with Ronnie Garvin, Jimmy Garvin, I mean, Luger, Ricky Morton, Ricky Wyndham, Morton Dusty, Wyndham, everybody. Nikita, Hawk. He's never <laughs> grabbed somebody by the nose. Well, I think the idea was to show, in Flair's mind, Sting was a little boy. And so he wasn't going to slap him or punch him. He was going to tweak his nose. And much to his surprise, Sting had the audacity to defend himself. <laughs> It's just preposterous. The promo is awesome. It's and, wacky pro wrestling, dude. And Sting beating his ass in the ring and doing every Ric Flair spot you've ever seen. It was amazing. Backdrop. <laughs> they hit the ground running. Oh, my God. It was every it was every match we've ever seen right from the opening bell. Sting versus Flair in 88 was Sting versus Flair from 98, actually. And oh, wow. 2001. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last yes. one. I don't know why I said 98. Uh, yeah. So... Sting beats his ass, press slams him for the very first time. One of thousands of press slams to come. And Tully and Arn hit the ring, but Lex and Barry run out to even the odds, and the horse and bail, and Flair is irate, and he keeps charging and backing down and charging and backing down. The best one is there's there's the three baby faces in the ring. There's Luger, Wyndham, and Sting. Flair is so furious about what happens that he runs off. He's in full crazy Flair 1999 mode. He, he rushes off, he grabs a steel chair, he runs back, and he's such a stupid heel that his idea is, I'm going to throw the chair in the ring, and then I'm going to get in the ring and pick the chair up. Yeah. Well, he throws the damn chair in the ring, and the baby faces grab it, so now he's even more furious. And he yes. Starts, I just love this. Yes. So this, I, I realize Barry Wyndham had been challenging Flair for the title for a long time, but he had not been a challenger recently, in recent months. And we had seen, and they did Flair Garvin for what felt like about five years last year. And uh, after that, Flair had his match with Hawk at the uh, uh, Bunkhouse Stampede to plug. But I don't think anyone, you know, people thought it'd be fun to see Flair and Hawk wrestle. But I don't think anyone thought Hawk was going to win the world championship. So my point is, Flair had not had a strong challenger in a long time now. And obviously here, the the, the primary build was Sting and Flair and uh, Lex and Barry, Barry would be challenging Tully and Arn. But the way this came off with Flair running wild and all three guys in the ring, you would buy any one of these guys as a legit challenger, challenger for Flair after this. This segment was awesome, too. Yeah. But one of them was standing high above the others. Sting was the man here. Yes. And, and uh, Lex and Barry were a tier below. That's fair. But they were all still, they, they were all still, it, Lex cut a promo, we already talked about it, but one of his key points was how the horsemen were great, but every franchise comes to an end, and they are the past, and he and Barry are the future. And you, as a wrestling fan, were watching this, thinking, you know, Wyndham's gonna, Wyndham has been a top guy for a while, but he's gonna be hitting new ground. Lex and Sting are peaking. This is the future. I'm looking at the future of this company right here, right now. This is a big deal. I should add, by the way, that Flair and Sting wrestled, I believe, in like 2010 in Impact. Oh, probably, yeah, actually. Yeah, so they... Uh, I haven't even thought about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there you go. They they had a lot of matches. They had and a they few. Were, and they were all exactly the same and very good. Yeah. 
Uh, Midnight Express versus uh, Alan Martin and Mike Jackson. So Cornette is running down every tag team he can think of. The Lightning Express, the Garvins, the Superpowers. Midnight's pinned Martin with the double goozle. And then the heels are cutting a promo. <laughs> Cornette. <laughs> so Cornette's changed his tune because this whole thing obviously is building to... You know, he, he talked earlier, he, he'll, he, he can take out any woman or whatever he said. So the, the, the key to all this is it's going to lead to Misty Blue uh, taking out Cornette. Well, Cornette changes his tune here. Now Dick Murdoch is his designated assassin to take Misty Blue out of the match. That's right. That's right. Dick's going to take out Misty. And they throw it to Dick, and he's ranting. The show just goes off the air. They have the temerity and the gall to cut Dick Murdoch off uh, the I sense. couldn't even believe it. I can only assume when he found this out, he went backstage and started throwing people out windows. I should note, by the way, that Cornette is so used to cutting promos on men that he's cutting this promo on Misty Blue, and every time he mentions her name, he adds brother. <laughs> Misty, Bru- Misty Blue, brother! And he goes on and on and on. Like, she'd be your sister, actually. Unless you're doing that on purpose, and it's supposed to be some sort of insult. Although I don't know why. She's definitely... Anyway. So that is the, uh, that's the show. It was fantastic. It was. It Throw was. out the date again for everybody. Vinny, they got to watch this show. Uh, it was the first February show. Let me open my notes back up. Uh, February 6th. Well, let's get funky like a monkey. Okay, well, we'll start with this NWA show, which frankly shouldn't take long. Not much happened. Uh, NWA World Championship Wrestling, February 13th, 1988. They recapped J.J. Dillon throwing his drink in Sting's face and Sting getting angry and kicking his ass. This was even better the second time. Sting, Sting's frozen reaction and then it's like he bursts into flame when he screams and attacks. It's just great. The announcers are in the studio running, running down the show. They're trying to go to the ring, but Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express interrupt. So Cornette claims that Bobby Eaton had beaten Dusty Rhodes, but he was screwed by a crooked ref. And he starts running down all the other tag teams, the Garvins, the Lightning Express, Wyndham and Luger. He says he tried to take the Midnights to a strip club, but they were swarmed by women and had to fight their way out. At this point, Stan began to flash his nipple to the crowd. I don't know if it was that or if his costume broke and all of a sudden he was like, I can show the world my shoulder, my bare shoulder. Yeah. He started showing it to everybody and, and smiling. Arn Anderson versus John Hold Savage. Hold on, we're getting ahead of ourselves. i got a lot to say here. Oh, we First off, they started off by announcing Shane Douglas Shane... was going to be on the show today. We just saw this fucking guy debut it on the show It is amazing the time, how the timing works out. We were watching Shane Douglas' debut on two different shows, 10 years apart, 20 years later. That was mind-boggling. Yes. So they announced that, and then Cornette's doing his, his big deal here. And you'll never guess what I was thinking while Cornette was ranting. I wish he had been in Crown Point, Indiana. Are Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton available for bookings? Oh, well, is that They're you? both alive. They are. They're both alive. And you know who else is alive? Dennis Condry. He is. Are any of these three men available for Crown Point? It's all I could think as I watched this here. Said Dick Murdoch wasn't there today. He claimed there was an incident. His mama's lawyers were working on it. Dick Murdoch's in Japan. Mm. Don't know how long this tour is going to be, but it's too long for me. He's already missed a show. Now we had Arn Anderson and John Savage. Well, after all that weight, Arn beat the fuck out of him, toyed around for a bit, hit him with a gourd buster, and pinned him. Yeah. It was fun. Nothing else to do it. So Dylan and Arn cut a promo. Explain. Tully Blanchard also, is also not there. He's on a respite in Maui. He's off in the islands. Because, you see, they're having so much trouble trying to find worthy challenges for the world tag team titles that Tully just had to go take a break. Arn's there. He says, we may have defended these titles three times all year, but nobody wants to fight us. He goes off on a spiel about working 60, 80, 100 hours a week to be the best. And he, the, the difference, he explained, he, he talked about the, uh, the the new kind of super group they have of Sting, Luger, and Wyndham. It says, yes, you're all three great athletes, but the difference between you and the Horsemen is we are great individuals, but we also sacrifice ourselves to make the team best. And that was that. It was fun. He made sure to mention a wise man once told him, no normal man ever achieves anything working 40 hours a week. Mm. He must work 60, 80, or 100 to be the best. Wise words from Arn. I see. Unfortunately, that's killed many a man. <laughs> you got to take the good with the bad. <laughs> he also used the old magazine term, 
fan favorites. He did. <laughs> he did. Fan Can't favorites. say baby faces. You have to say the fan favorites. Yeah, the flip side of that was always rule breaker. That's right. What if that's what you call himself? A rule breaker and a fan favorite. Yeah. Eddie Gilbert versus David Isley. So this went on too long anyway, and then Isley made a comeback. It was bad. Yeah. I'm watching David Isley run corner to corner and do monkey flips. Eddie pinned him with a hot shot. Magnum TA interviewed Dusty Rhodes about Dusty Rhodes was absolutely enormous <laughs> on the <this> show. <laughs> I could not believe how big he was here. He was huge. No shirt on. Splotches in full view. He starts talking about animal. Now I got some scoops here. Mm. Thirty years later. Impressive detective work. Yes. I did some research. So there was a bench press contest. Yes. And there was all that stuff that happened, mm-hmm. and they claimed that the weights or something fell on Animal, and he suffered an eye injury. That was the heels claim. Yes. We all yes. saw them throw his head into the weights. Okay, they, yeah. yeah. So then the claim was that Animal suffered a broken orbital bone. Mm-hmm. Okay. How many times did we watch this, and we couldn't figure out where he hurt his orbital bone? I watched it over and over. Hmm. His head came nowhere near the weights. But everyone insisted he broke his orbital bone. That's real. So, as it turns out, it wasn't during the bench press contest that he broke his orbital bone. It was like the day before, or a couple of days before. They were having some sort of match, and I forget the move. It was like Warlord or somebody gave him a Samoan drop or something, and he busted open his orbital bone. That sucks. So Animal, he knew his eye was screwed up, Mm -hmm. but he didn't think it was that bad. So he went to do the bench press contest. So... Animal can actually bench press, or at the time, I don't know about now, obviously, but he could bench press over 500 pounds, Sure. and Warlord could go over 500, and Barbarian could go over 500. Hawk was not a good bench presser. Oh, really? So He looked like a guy who could be a good bench presser, but okay. Sure. So Animal knew his eye was bad. They didn't know how bad, Mm -hmm. but they were concerned that if they put the real weight on the bar, he might blow his eye socket out. I see. So that's why they used gimmick numbers. Yeah. So... I was right when we were adding up all the weights, Mm -hmm. and I was like, there's no way this is 480 pounds. That's what happened. It was like 300 or something. He's still fucking bench pressing with 320 pounds in a blown-out eye socket. Yes. So they did the whole deal, and they threw his head into the thing or whatever to explain the injury. So he goes to the hospital, and he just figured his eye was messed up. His eye was so messed up, they almost had to take his eye out. Ooh. Yeah. So he ended up getting his surgery or whatever. He ended up being fine. But that's the actual story of the eye injury that didn't actually happen in the bench press contest. Lesson here is do not fuck around with eye injuries. No, hell no. <laughs> that's bad news. Uh, so Dusty here in this promo. Dusty is still a six-man tag team champions with the Road, with the Road Warriors. So his, his brother has fallen. He runs down Paul Jones and the powers of pain. And eventually he turns. he's also the U.S. champion. So he talks about the U.S. title contenders, including Bobby Eaton... And Larry Zabisco, who has, quote, that smut, dirt-ridden baby doll. Oh, that's just not right. Yes. And he did keep... Dusty's cutting this promo, and he's talking about animal and hockey. Yeah. He's talking about hockey. It took me a while to figure out who Like, the first time he said it, I was like, who the fuck's hockey? What are you talking about hockey? He's talking about hawk. Yes. Of a hawk and animal. That's his pet name for this 285-pounder. Hockey. Yes. Hockey then wrestled Ryan Wagner and Keith Steinborn. He was so fired up. I've seen a million Road Warrior matches. They do the big diving shoulder tackle. They just jump really high and go horizontal. The guy runs into him. Hawk actually launched himself like a missile through this man. He just exploded through whoever this was. Hit a big flying lariat and pinned him in 30 seconds. They did a promo. Oh, Paul Ellering. His gimmick is he's a wise man. (laughs) Okay. I never knew how wise he was until this show. Hmm. Paul Littering said, I have learned in my life that you can either educate people or ignore them. Hmm. I thought that should be the tagline of the fucking internet. <laughs> right? <laughs> you can either educate he, didn't people he call himself or Mr. fucking Dot com? ignore them. Yes, he, Mr. Dot com. He knew what he was talking about. He was a genius, a man before his time. Yes. So... He said the education of Jones, Barbarian, and the Warlord had begun because we can no longer ignore them. 
The situation with Animal is not pretty. He can't see out of one eye. And he explained, the road warriors live by the code of Bushido. Bushido. The, the code of the warrior. An eye for an eye, an arm for an arm, a leg for a leg. I don't think that's Bushido. <laughs> I think he made that part up. That's the Bible, as I recall. Uh, he promised they would defend the six-man titles that night in Philadelphia, and Animal would be in their corner. He said every day Hawk strove to wake up and look at himself in the mirror. Animal, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said about Hawk. Okay. He strives every day to wake up and look at himself in the mirror. So Hawk says he and Animal are the biggest scumbags around, and now Jones and the men have pissed them off, and it's time for payback, which is fun for us and not for you. Better than most talk promos. Not as good as last week, but it no, was, last it was week was awesome. Better than most. It was also better than Barry Windham's promo. Yeah, but you know what? He's just every handsome young '80s soft-spoken baby face. He's a t- very tall, very pretty, blonde-haired, blue-eyed young man. He, he's he, he is the boy next door. Yeah, he really is. He, there's so many larger than life guys here. There's Dusty, whatever he is. There's post-apocalyptic warriors like the Road Warriors. You need all kinds. For Millionaires the, for the young... like the Horsemen, and here's Barry Windham, a fella. Yeah, the young ladies out there, they all like the, somebody the, different. The young ladies do like this guy. So he's running down Larry Zbysko. He says he's got a rematch with the Western States Heritage title. I can't believe this fucking belt's still around. The Western States Heritage Championship is still uh, at stake. He and Lex are going after the tag title. Sting's going after Ric Flair's world title. Let's talk about this more. Okay. This guy is such a classic babyface that even though he could be vowing for the heavyweight championship of the world... He is willing to step aside so that his buddy can go and grab the top prize. Mm-hmm. Him and Lex will just team up and take these tag titles. Sure. Sting can go and beat Ric Flair. The, the, the whole, that, that whole side of the company has pitched Sting as their guy. They're all behind him. Yeah, they should be. He's by far He's number fucking one Sting. right now. Yes. These other Lugers talking too much. <laughs> Barry Windham is just too quiet. Well, uh, back to Windham here. He finishes, and it, he, it, it would be done. It would be a bad promo, but nothing notable. And then Crockett says, you know, you and uh, Lex Luger have been teaming up a lot. They're calling you guys the Twin Towers. And he holds the mic up to Barry, and Barry says, well, I don't know about that. It's flattering. And he leaves. Yeah. That sucked. Well. That was terrible. Can't win them all. No, and he did not win this one. The Jive Tones versus Gary Royal and Mike Jackson. Weren't you putting over the damn Jive Tones like a couple of weeks ago? They had one great performance. You, do you apologize now for this fucking opinion? <laughs> this is not a great performance. They well, did a fucking move here. <laughs> and keep in mind, they're doing it with Mike Jackson, the king of the jobbers. A guy that if they can get that fucking guy to crown point, I will go in there and I'll put him over. And I don't put anybody over. They're in there with this guy. They decide to do their new move. Which is, I'm going to tell you what it's called, okay? It's called a double front neck breaker. Okay. This sounds serious. <laughs> it's a fucking side rush. It's a double forward side rush and leg sweep. It looks so stupid. Yeah. Everybody looks dumb doing it. <laughs> it he like, I can't remember which jive tone it was, but like, you got to put your arms like behind the guy and then kind of go forward. One of them has his hand on the back of Jackson's head, like he's palming a basketball. And he just fucking rams the guy's head into the mat as they do this move. And then, that's not even the finish. No. The finish is a normal side rush. They pick him up and do another move. This was horrible. Did we mention this uh, double face buster thingy? It's basically Jeff Jarrett, when he does it, he calls it the stroke. It's a double stroke. This was a double stroke. Yeah, two men stroked this guy. And it looked like <laughs> Tony's You blinked. heard me, Tony. It That's looked, what happened. If, if you had turned the commentary off or just watching this, you would think Jackson gra- grabbed these guys and hit a double bulldog. It or looked like, it looked like he was on offense. You'd think that someone fucked up and went the wrong way on a double side Russian leg Or they all just fell down. That's also a possibility. It sucked. They go to commercial. Now, Duke, <laughs> the promo... Promo was was first of all memorable. First of all, oh boy, was it memorable! They now during the commercial break they put their top hats and bow ties and tuxedo jackets back on, still shirtless, of course. And the the promo comes up and they're dancing. And Crockett asks them what they're doing. He says, "We're dancing the Temptations. What's the Jive Tones do?" 
That's her music. And we, we, the, the Temptations, because if you watch, when the, the match is over, it abruptly goes to break. So they didn't bother editing out the music. They just cut it off. So the Jive Tones are right here dancing the Temptations, doing their music. And Shaska goes first, and it's great. He runs down the Lightning Express. Dusty Rhodes, I never liked you anyway, Dusty Rhodes. Nikita Koloff, they don't allow Russians where I'm from. The Road Warriors, you're not afraid of them either. And then Tiger Conway Jr. Oh, starts to speak. Oh, my God, we found out why this guy never does promos. First thing he says, good things come to those who wait, and we've got all the time in the world. Well, they don't have any time anymore because he talked throughout all of it. He goes on and on and on. I had no idea what he was saying at the time. We're going to put something on you, he says. You won't be able to get it off. Tell him, Tiger. Or t- tell him, uh, Shaska. And Shaska gets as far as, well, and Tiger says, that's right. <laughs> and he cuts him off. He goes again. This happened two or three times where he asked Shaska to speak and they cut him off immediately. This thing went for minutes. It was terrible. Finally, by the end, Shaska like intervenes and says, like, and that's all we got to say about that. And he turns and starts to walk. He's pissed. <laughs> He's pissed at Tiger Conway for cutting a shitty promo and ruining his segment. You can't win them all. This was actually so bad it was good. I don't know if I'd go that far. I can say that. It was so bad it sucked. It did that's suck. What, that's what I'd get at. It, it, it certainly is. sucked. That's true. Lex Luger versus Alan Martin. So Lex beats him in a minute with a torture rack. He goes to cut a promo. And he's talking about his time with the horseman and how he sacrificed his friends and family and how his just happy to get a second chance, and suddenly you started rewinding. Okay, hold on a second. You're getting ahead of ourselves here. There are three notable things about this promo. Notable thing number one is Luger beat him with a torture rack in like a minute. Okay? Goes over to the announce booth. He's fucking winded. Of course. He can barely spit out his promo. If you didn't know anything about wrestling, and you watched this here, you'd see this dude... Big, jacked-up dude doing a very, very short match and then gasping for air. You would presume he'd be dead in five years. He's still around. Yes. That's number one. Number two, we don't need to waste time. He fucking talked forever. He talked and 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 he talked fucking forever. Thirdly, we're watching him talk. And suddenly, it occurred to me, this fucking guy is soaking wet. He's drenched with sweat. And I thought, you know what? He was not sweating when he came out. No. So, and I remember this because he looked a little bigger than usual, and he was not quite as cut. So I remember seeing that when he first came out to do his promo. It's the right. first thing I noticed. So then I'm, my brain is thinking, and I realize he was dry. So we rewound it. And literally, he begins his promo dry. And as he talks, he starts getting wetter and wetter. Yes. And seriously, like two minutes in, he is drenched with sweat from head to toe. <laughs> it's amazing. So we add that to him being completely gassed after like a one-minute match. How did this guy survive I don't know. all these years? It was spectacular. You pointed out how just how sweaty he was, and and then how sweaty he got after that. Yeah, it, he's cutting this promo in the shower. Yeah, it was crazy. It, it, it was nuts. I was rewinding, and you were like, "Are you just going to see how long he was talking?" And That's I what said, I thought. I thought you no, were no, rewinding because no. he had talked for three minutes. He wanted the exact time. And I went back to the big night and said, "Look, he's dry." Yes. And all I did was I hit that ten second button, ten second button, ten second button. You're laughing by the third time. Yeah. It's crazy. It was nuts. I have never sweat that bad in a full two hours of doing the show, or however, in this sweat box of a room, and. It was a hot day here in Seattle, and obviously a lot hotter other parts of the world. In my brain, I'm thinking, you know, he's in Atlanta. Maybe it was a hot, humid day. Then I remembered, this was February. Yeah. <laughs> so that's out. Yeah. I don't know why Lex Luger was so sweaty on this show. Dylan and Flair did a promo. They plugged the cage match. Flair talks for a while. The cage match, I should add, that uh, Lex was plugging. is Lex and Oli versus Tully and Arn. Yeah. So... Flair starts talking about how there's a lot of people around here that got belts. 
but the best of the best uh, around are the guys who have the belts with the word "world" on them. World tag team champion yeah. or world heavyweight champion. So he starts, t- starts talking about Luger. Luger, you see, had earlier talked about how he had sacrificed his friends and his family and uh, t- turned them out of his life to spend time with the horsemen. So Flair goes off about their time oh, on the road. Man, he threw this fucking guy under the bus. <laughs> I didn't hear you complaining, Luger, when you were out on the road making love to beautiful women every night. You didn't care about your family then. You'd come up to me the next day and say, this is the way to live. I love this it. This is the way to live. He runs down Sting. He runs down Luger. He has the greatest. He's First off, he's going absolutely nuts. I don't know how he wasn't drenched in sweat. You got to go suit. back. I, 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 neither of us can do justice to this promo. Oh, we are this, not Ric Flair. This no. was one of those all-time great Flair promos. Go back and listen to it. But he has a line. He starts talking about this young fucker Sting. <laughs> and he promises... <laughs> This is what he promises. Is that the new New Japan tournament, the Young Fuckers Cup? Yes. This is what he promises, Vinny, when he gets his hands on Sting. Blood, broken bones, and a letter to his family. Mm. <laughs> That's serious. That is serious. When the postman delivers a letter to the family? Yeah. That's serious. The letter is not Sting's doing fine. No. no. Not an email, by the way. Not- this was back when you sent a letter. I'm surprised he didn't say telegram. This man is not coming back from war. No. <laughs> we apologize. He did say, you know what, Sting and Luger and Wyndham, you're all awfully good athletes. There's a chance I might even lose this title to, you, title to one of you, but if I do, I'll get it back in a week. I like that line. Then we had, I think, my favorite thing in the whole show. <laughs> it was something else. This dude. was so 1980s. It cuts the shots of fans and very, very, very low rent by 1988 standards graphics that just read, Dream Match! Yes. Dream Match! Dream Match! It's the NWA Dream Match Sweepstakes. Here's the sweepstakes, which we'll get to how you enter shortly. But the there's a long list of prizes you can win, and they start at the bottom. First, British Knights Athletic Footwear. Oh! Can't call them shoes or sneakers. Athletic Footwear. Huffy Bicycles. Up I had a Huffy when I was a kid. I had I had a bike. I it got stolen. I remember this now. Mine was also stolen. I don't know who I the fuck would steal 18, a Huffy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. A VCR every week. So you can record NWA Championship Wrestling. Wow. Yes. You can win a, That's a big fucking prize in 1988. It was a huge prize in 1988. I think it was probably worth like $5,000. And weighed 5, yeah, we 5,000 pounds. Yeah. A vacation. One vacation to Port Aransas, Texas. Excuse me? That's what it said. There's some resort there. The grand prize, though. This grand prize. A four-night trip for two to New York City. Oh, holy smokes. You'd go to Bound for Glory. A $15,000 electronic shopping spree. What does that mean? Uh, I assume it means they take you to Radio Shack. Huh. Give you 15 grand. Have you buy a couple of tandies? But then the real, the real jewel in this prize, though... Is you get to pick the dream match, the match of the year. So going over the rules, you have to send in a postcard. Had to be at least fourteen years old. Enter as often as you wish. We will draw one at random. And as the 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 narr- or, uh, voiceover guy is reading all this, the actual instructions for the contest fly up the screen in fine print. And it would take him way too long to go back and check. But there actually were rules about just what kind of match you could book. Like any singles or tag team match, a sixty minute time limit. Why no even longer. bother? Like if you Well, because they didn't want to I guess someone, they were gonna do a real draw. They didn't want to draw someone and have this kid I say, see. I want Ric Flair in a barbed wire cage match against fourteen men. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they won't do that. They should have just said name two guys. Don't yeah. even worry about the stip. Which two guys would you like to see in the ring together? Yeah. Make it easy. Border Rancis. Hundred and eighty miles southeast of San Antonio. Population thirty four eighty. Mm. And this sounds like a party town. Hmm. Anyway, this is great. Ricky Santana versus Tommy Angel. Wow, I didn't know that. Port Aransas was a location of pirates in the early 19th century. Well, see, now you want to go. Captain Jean Lafitte. Uh-huh, see? He was a wrestler. <laughs> you are intrigued. His buccaneers spent time on the coast. That's crazy. That's PCO. Yeah, it is. Yeah. He's out of his mind. That's what I hear. Yeah. I mean, we've known that when he did that dive in TNA yeah. 50 years ago. 
Ricky Santana versus Tommy Angel. He wrestled for 15 seconds and then went to commercial. I don't know why they even bother starting it. Best part of this match was when Santana ducked a clothesline and Tommy Angel threw the funniest missed clothesline you've ever seen. And then Santana had a body press in one. And he did the usual. Plugged a California tour. Cut a promo uh, in English. He goes, you're going to remember Ricky Santana. Do you not remember him? I, I remembered him, but not well. He's an incredibly bland man. Yes. He, he's going to California in English. He's going to California in Spanish. He's going to make you remember him. And he left. Let's talk about Max McGiver and Curtis Thompson versus the Lightning Express. If the Lightning Express are available, and I know obviously Brad Armstrong is not, I don't want to wrestle him. just want to throw that out there. Okay. We'll be sure not to book you. I don't want to wrestle Max McGiver. It's fucking terrible. No body, skinny fat, generic black spandex tights. He wasn't horrible in the ring, but he was no good. And he would take those Frankenstein dead body bumps when somebody hit him. Fall down, arms by the sides. Just horrific. But I will give him credit. He held his back Mm. after taking a bump. (laughs) Great. He understood that it's supposed to hurt. Yeah. And then the Lightning Express go in there, and they decide, we're going to have a match. But not a match where we, like, give the other guys anything. We're going to do a match where we go in there, and we hit them with a bunch of moves, and they fucking keep kicking out. This is the worst kind of squash match. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is. Then, 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 at that point, this becomes the horrible UFC fight, where one guy is clearly way ahead on points and doesn't try to finish. Not even that. At least that, like, that's different, Vinny. This is, you're hitting jobbers with your moves, and they're kicking out. Yes. You fucking suck. Yes. You're trying to win, unlike that shithead in the UFC. Yeah. You can't beat these guys with your moves. Yes. And it's the fucking Lightning Express, so, of all people, it's impossible to care about them. They finally won with the uh, assisted leg drop. They pinned McGiver. And we're not mispronouncing that, by the way. M-C-G-I-V-E-R, McGiver. Yeah, they pronounced it MacGyver, but they spelled it McGiver. They do this all the time on this show. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the ref counts three, here come the sheep herders. They're about to do Horner a favor and cut off his mullet. (laughs) They're going to cut Horner's mullet off until Armstrong makes a save with a chair. So the sheep herders flee, and then the Lightning Express cut the, the most unintentionally hilarious promo. Well, hold on. Tim Horner's promo was hilariously awful. Okay, so the sheep herders ran in, and they're going to cut off his mullet, okay? His buddy makes a save. In Tim Horner's brain, because they're sheep herders, yeah. they weren't coming in to cut off his mullet. No. They were coming in to shear him. That is the idea. They're Vinny. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, they do not have... Uh, you know, clippers, they had big giant scissors. <laughs> you don't shear with these, you cut. This fucking guy is screaming that he's not an animal. He said. He's talking about being sheared. Let me tell you what he said when he when Crockett hands him the mic. What's going on, David Crockett? What's going on? I'm not no animal. And he keeps on for a while. You want to shear me? I'm not no sheep. <laughs> I'm... I'm not no sheep. That's a grown man. <laughs> yeah! I'm not no sheep. Then he cuts his angry promo. He claims that Johnny Ace is a full-blooded American, not an Australian. And then he says... Or New Zealander. In... Th- whatever. In the... the now the Australians in New Zealand are yeah, very I, upset. Yeah. Now he finishes up Tim Horner with this catchphrase. Tim Horner, we're lightning, and we're gonna strike. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you don't know when or where. Then Brad Armstrong actually cut a, a decent baby Before face Before he promo. did, Tim Horner kicked the ring and said, Gah! <laughs> so Brad Armstrong, it was much better. Much better than Tim's. I did like the line where he says, These guys work in America. They drive American cars, but all they ever do is run down America and everything about it, including, he says, American women. He's most disgusted that they're running down American women. American women. The best women in the world. Of all things, the best in the world. Yeah. Got to throw that out there in case the women are interested in young Mr. Armstrong here. He also said the American flag was the original red, white, and blue, which is not true. 
Pretty sure. Somebody look that up. Mike Rotunda versus Rocky King for the world TV title. Yeah. Rocky King gets a title shot. Yeah. So he lost. Rocky got one hip toss just, go, just so Rotunda could pop up and look indignant. And then Rotunda squashed him in one of the double arm suplex. Thank God for Kevin Sullivan. He cut a much better promo than the match itself. Yes. And once again, everybody remembers the Varsity Club. It's not that exciting. Oh, come on now. But no, no, no. Here's the key, Vinny. It's because it's two college athletes who are being managed by a fucking devil worshiper. That's the plan. Okay, this is impossible to forget. (laughs) Okay? It's fucking ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, there was one good thing about this. This is the highlight of uh, uh, Mike Rotundo, IRS, his whole family, the Wyndhams, the Mulligans, the Wyatts. The best that ever happened in any of their careers. I'll be Sullivan. Okay. Because I want you to be Rotunda. I'm sure you do. Sullivan just mentions Dusty Rhodes, the Bull of the Woods. Mike Rotundo pretends he's a fucking cow. He moves like a cow. Sullivan did not know this was coming. He's standing in front because he's talking in short. And he says, the Bull of the Woods. And then Rotunda goes, moo! And Sullivan stops. And he looks behind him, and he looks back, <laughs> and he just carries on. It was so funny. It was so funny. And then, I forget if it was Tony or Crockett, whoever's interviewing him, but he's confused, too. Rotunda looks at him. What are you looking at? Yeah, what are you looking at? <laughs> I just mooed. I just mooed like a goddamn cow. Uh, so they'd run down everybody. The key here, as we will later get to, is uh, they're running down Jimmy Garvin, because they do not like men who are ruled by women. Oh, mm-hmm. that's the worst, they say. Yeah. Sting versus Bob Riddle. Sting is now using the guitar riff entrance music that Eddie Gilbert had been using until last week, I think. So Bob challenges Sting to a pose down. He loses, and Sting wins with the Splash and the Scorpion. We had another incredible... How did it take this guy so long to be in the Hall of Fame? He's a fucking Hall of Famer right here. This promo. He has more charisma than everybody on the show put together that's not part of the Horseman. See, I actually I said that he has more charisma than anyone on the show, including Flair. Uh, I don't know if I'd go that far. He's got a different kind of charisma. He's a he's a crazy he he's just a crazy young guy. Many, That's his gimmick. Many many years ago, I was watching old tapes with Buddy, and we got some Randy Savage and Memphis stuff, and they're doing a sit down. There's almost like a talk show segment, but it's in a studio. It's just just him and some other guy, and this is such a horrible low rent copy. You couldn't you couldn't understand one word Randy Savage said. But you could not turn away. You had to watch him to see what he was doing and saying what would happen next. That's what Sting was here. What he said often made no sense, including to himself. He lost his train of thought at one point. He like turned and asked. He always does. No, this is sometimes he'll pause and collect himself. There was a point here where he just stops, and, like stands up, puts his hand in his mouth, turns around. <laughs> it took him a long time to get back on track. But you can't stop watching him. No, he's crazy. It is impossible not to watch Sting cut this promo. You think he might blow up or something? <laughs> Anything could happen. Yeah. The fans start shouting things to him. It, what do the fans say here? Uh, I didn't write it down. The fans say something like, Flair's in trouble. And he stings like, you're right, Flair's in trouble. And everyone goes, yay! Just an explosion of charisma. You, you cannot not watch Sting. He's amazing. He says, I want to know where Flair's at. I'll find him right now. He turns around. They're attracted to turned backs. Yes. That's what he says. Every time he turns his back, he knows they'll come out, but they're not going to now because he's got Lex Luger and Barry Windham around. That's right. They're not going to come out tonight. He admits, he says, Flair cheats every now and then, but he is a five-time champion, so he's very good. Yes. And then his conclusion, danger's my business. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's about what he did. Yeah. He also, somewhere in there, threatened to run up Flair's beak of a nose and beat his chest. Yes. What? That's what he said. That doesn't make any sense. Well, beat his own chest, you see. I see. Yeah. The Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff versus Three Geeks. Now, Brian, I don't know if you have seen this man or remembered him. This was uh, the first time. There, a very famous jobber. Randy Hogan. Randy Hogan. Do you remember him? I remembered him when I saw him. Okay. Randy Hogan, everyone, went out and said, I'm small. I have no body. I have no charisma. I need to be remembered. I will steal the last name of the biggest star in all of wrestling. Then I will steal his haircut and mustache. 
Yeah. So if you're watching this, you are assuming Randy Hogan is Hulk Hogan's much older, much shittier brother. That's not what I thought at all. No. I thought this guy's an idiot. Or that too. This is what this. Okay, if you've. Never, By the way, he also saw Randy Savage's first name. If you've never seen Randy Hogan, just imagine James Ellsworth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With Hulk Hogan's hair. With Hulk Hogan's hair and mustache. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. That's what you got right here. Yes. The announcers bury him. <laughs> they note that Warlord and Barbarian are much bigger than Hogan. <laughs> they, there's a point where they're... Because they didn't do intros for this match. So we didn't get their names until later. I just recognized Randy Hogan because he's Randy fucking Hogan. But as they're beating the hell out of him, Ross is like, the, the powers of pain here are totally overmatching Randy Hogan. <laughs> You couldn't believe this. It wasn't enough to steal the, the Fu Manchu. We had to go with a Randy Hogan. So they beat him up for a while. For those of you who keep detailed records, Gene Miller and Steve Atkinson. Thank you. The other two men. Uh, the Warlord used a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, which is notable because it is a wrestling move. And eventually they pinned Miller with an assisted Russian hammer. They go to cut a promo. By, is, this is actually fantastic because Jones does most of the talking. This Ivan, was one of Paul Jones' better promos. It was, it was great too, but he was excellent. Jones does most of the talking. Ivan does a little talking. Warlord and Barbarian are mute, yes. but, they, but they put them in front, and they stand there and blow out their chests. And they put Jones and Ivan had to be like ten feet behind them, so they just looked tiny. And these men look like titans. As noted, Jones got a very good promo. My men outlifted the warriors. We left them laying. Dusty Rhodes, you want to stick your nose in our business? We'll leave you laying, too. He explains the ladder match. We'll take $50,000 of my money that my men won in the bench press contest. We'll hang, we'll hang it above the ring. And if you want to get it, all you got to do is get that ladder, climb to the top rung, and grab the, grab the bag of money. Sounds easy. Right? No! It's so great. The Road Warriors are gun-shy now, he says. Ivan intervenes. I saw Road Warrior Hawk out here. His face was red with rage. Or was it embarrassment? Ha, ha, ha. Says Animal will be foolish to show up. But they knew he would be foolish enough to show up for their matches. And if he does, they would permanently blind him. That is what is at stake now, everyone, in these Road Warriors Powers of Pain matches. Not titles. Eyeballs. Not money. Sight. Eyeballs. Yep. Eyesight is on the line here. They yes. They have raised the stakes. The sheep herders cut a promo. Thank God. <laughs> I didn't bother recapping this, but they're such a great promo. Between them and Paul Jones. Th this is not much of a show. No, no, no. They're totally different. Paul Jones is incompetent. Usually. Which makes him amazing. Yes. He's so funny. But actually, he cut a good promo on this on, show. On this show. But usually, he just mumbles everything. He's marble-mouthed. These guys, they... You know what these guys are like? They're like Cornette. They never stumble over their words. No. They talk a million miles an hour. Yes. They yes. never miss the point. Well, mostly uh, uh, Luke is the one who never talks. I think so. I think, I think Butch is the talking. Yeah, Luke's Butch quiet. does all we, the talking. We should know by now. Yeah, Luke, Luke yeah, Butch, Butch is the talker. But anyway, he's fantastic. Luke just stands there and grunts every now and then. Johnny Ace is behind him, shaved his mustache. Yes. Looks much less creepy now. Looks like a baby face, actually. And it was great. I loved it. So they explain, when they are back on the ranch in New Zealand working with the sheep, they have to shear the sheep. Yes. And every once in a while, one sheep will get away. Usually, they say, a mixed blood sheep. It's part American. So they run that sheep down, and they shear him, and they cut off some of his flesh for good measure. So the Lightnings had failed to respect the real red, white, and blue flag, and for that they're going to pay. And finally he promises, we're going to clean up these scruffy American louts. Louts. Oh, scruffy American louts. This is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Ron Garvin and Gorgeous Jimmy versus the Red Raider and Joe Cruz. The Red Raider. Mm -hmm. Fat guy in a mask. He got punched and pinned. And yes, for those of you wondering, Jim Ross was there to make college football jokes about the Texas Tech team. Uh, he tagged in, Ronnie punched him and pinned him. And the Garvin's cut a promo. Well, Jimmy cut a promo, but the first thing he says is, from now on, we're going to do our talking in the ring. And then he did his talking right here at the podium. Yeah, I was like, are you doing talking in the ring or here at the podium, dude? So he briefly he says... he cut a good promo. Going after the Midnight Express's U.S. Tag Team titles, and, but then he's got more important matters. Kevin Sullivan. A dark cloud, he says, is hanging over this company. This promo, it was like he's reading The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But in, it's about fucking Kevin Sullivan. 
He's talking about how he's a dangerous man. He's not here to win money. He's not here to win matches. He's only here to make people uncomfortable. And very, very bad things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Fans, you should be worried. <laughs> Danger and doom is coming. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, it's fucking Kevin Sullivan and two college guys. Like, what's going on here? He's got a cauldron somewhere. He's going to curse the people that show up at the TBS studios. He said he warned Sullivan, if you ever mention Precious's name again, Ronnie and I will be there to shut your mouths and your two goons too. She was red hot on this show. I'll throw that in there. And in the main event, Shane Douglas versus George South. So they claimed that he was 19, 20 years old. He was 25. Mm -hmm. He claims he broke in in 1982. But maybe a little later than that. Yep. But one way or the other, he's there. He's, he looks so young. <laughs> he's unbelievable. If you told me he was like 12 here, I might have believed it. He was at least 30 pounds smaller than his Nitro debut. Yeah, his Nitro debut would have been 10 years later. 11. 11. Yeah. How the road... Owned him. How the road had owned this young man here. Those years in ECW added 30 years to his life. Easy. Actually, it took it away. Well, yeah, I guess you could put it that way. But, uh, yes. So, he won quickly with a sleeper. And then he... Of course, he had to wake George up afterwards, so it's not to let him die. And then pretty little clean-cut, blue-eyed Shane cuts a short promo. It was good. It, it was funny because he got a very deep voice. And hearing that voice come out of this tiny little body was funny. Isn't this the Weaver Lock? What's going on? Uh, it's only the Weaver Lock if, Dusty you, does if you are Johnny Weaver or you know him. I see. There's a special technique. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So he's talking about all the great talent in this company, but it sure would be, it would be great to be the youngest world champion ever. And they immediately yanked the mic away and wrapped up the I'll show. I'll bet. That was it. That was it? Uh, yeah, not much happened on that one. I liked the Sheep Herders promo. I liked the Sting promo. I liked this show. It wasn't the most exciting show in the world, but... Like, nothing happened on it. I was never bored. I was bored for the Lightning Express, I'm not going to lie. I should call them the Thunder Express or the... That, even that's too exciting. I don't think... I can't think of a good word for the that. The Mild Breeze Express? Something like that. <laughs> So let's get fucking like a monkey. Let's uh, get going here. This is all far more exciting than this particular episode of World Championship Wrestling. February 20th, 1988. A show where, like, nothing happened. It was a very non-newsworthy yeah. sort of show here, I gotta admit. Nothing happened. Nothing happened, and, and what did happen was not... At one point here, it occurred to me, it's been months since we've had just an a, a unwatchably terrible jobber. There were some bad ones in the show, but... No, what happened, Vinny, is we've we've got it out of our system. That may be it, too. There's some fucking guys on this show. I got a couple of comments. Yeah. They're they're terrible. Like, if we just started watching today, we'd have ripped apart every single jobber here on this show. That may be true. How many times can you rip apart Max McGiver? Well. But I do have something to say about him as we get to it. We'll get there soon. Show opened with clips of Sting working Ric Flair over in a match somewhere. The announcers announced that Ivan Koloff and the Powers of Pain... And won the world six-man titles from Dusty Rhodes and the Road Warriors in a cage yes. match in Philadelphia. Heat. Yes. They, 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 so they beat him in the bench press, or they beat him up in the bench press contest, and now they've taken their six-man belts. I mean, realistically, Animal broke his orbital bone. As if they, He's a very seriously injured man. They never addressed it on this show. I think last week they said it would actually be Paul Ellering wrestling. See, the belts. then yeah. they should have won. Yeah. That makes sense. Logic. And they said in the Omni, Lex Luger had barely escaped serious injury. And a new team was formed. And they never really explained what happened to Lex. We'll get to it. Varsity Club versus Max McGiver and Curtis Thompson. So the Varsity Club comes down to the ring. That's right. I do remember, I do remember McGiver now. They're doing these <sighs> jumping jacks or whatever, these push-ups. Calisthenics. And, yeah, calisthenics because they're, you know, the, sat the satanic leader yes. is making sure that they're in shape. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, then... I look across the ring, and there's Max McGiver and Curtis Thompson. And it was like, I see these guys every week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We saw these two shitheads last week. We saw them the week before. We saw them the week before that. They're fucking terrible. They come out here. They get their asses kicked. But you know what? They just keep coming back. 
<laughs> so you admire their persistence. Though. I really did. I was watching this, and I was trying to find something to talk about. Well, there's that, too. That's what I came up with. Like, And I, I seriously thought that, too. As I watched it, I thought, this we're supposed to pretend this is real. These two dudes, Max McGiver, or MacGyver, we don't fucking know. They screwed up every week. Him and Curtis Thompson, every week they show up at the wrestling event with their outfits on, and they get in the ring, and they just do their best. They do. And every week they get their ass kicked. They do. Because they fucking suck in storyline. They sure do. But they keep coming back. And I just imagine them thinking, someday... It's going to be our day. Right? Well, today was not that day. Like, the odds are, at some point, if we keep trying, somebody's going to slip on a banana peel. We can't lose every match till the end of time. Somebody's going to have a bad day. But then I got to even think even more. When's the last time we saw Jobbers win on this program? When was the Mulkies deal? It was a couple of years ago. Yeah. But that was it, right? Yeah, it would be the The Mulkies randomly got a win on television. The place goes nuts. Have we ever seen the Mulkies again? No, nah, I don't think so. I if, think we saw them like one time and, if we and did, never again. They didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like these guys come here every week trying to win, but the jobbers should know that one jobber team has had a big win on television and they were never seen again. Why the fuck do you keep trying? <laughs> Just fucking give up and do something else with your life. That's deep, man. Thanks. It's deep. So the varsity club took them apart. Steiner's offense included dragging him in around by the ears. He kept pretending to, as he said, brush their teeth, where he just grind his ma- uh, fist across their mouth repeatedly. And what fin- a dick move! It was a total bully dick move. <laughs> Finally, he hit McGiver with a belly to back suplex and submitted him with a sugar hold. Yeah, the sugar hold. While My brushing his teeth. Hold. Yes. So they joined their sat- Satan worshiping boss Kevin Sullivan for a promo. So what a promo this guy cuts. <laughs> Starts talking about how he is telling a story about prehistoric climate change. Yeah. This is in 1988 and how it killed off the Mastodon. Yes. He says, something happened, he says, that made the climate change. Very scientific. The dodo, he said, hunted to extinction. The California golden bear. The California golden bear. Extinct, he says. Extinction is forever. May not be. I'll need to follow up with him on that. See if he's changed his mind. Hmm. If, if he's following the uh, advancements in cloning. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They may bring back that fucking mastodon of all animals. That's actually true. So he promised that soon Barry Windham and Dusty Rhodes and Jimmy Garvin, Garvin would all be extinct. He mentioned Garvin was the dodo who had another bird pecking in his ear. It's a shot of precious. Shane Douglas versus Thunderfoot number two. Shane was every 1980s babyface ever. Now, before we even get to the match, they announced, coming up next, this is an exact quote, the exciting Shane Douglas. I thought, well, you know, last week he was more exciting than he was when we watched him on Nitro 10 years later. But he fucking, he was exciting for like 10 seconds. He was a young Okada. He did this high drop kick. He was young and athletic. He was agile. And then he grabbed that arm. Do an arm bar for two minutes. Do one high spot. Do another arm bar for another two minutes. Repeat for days. I just kept going. Finally, he won with the belly to belly, which took like three tries to get it right. It looked to be a shoot by the end. It may have been by the end. I wasn't going up, and and finally he just gave him that belly to belly. So he goes to get a promo. Ricky Santana is out there in a suit. He congratulates Shane on his win. Offers his services as a partner. Shane says it would be an honor to team with Ricky Santana. And Crockett asks about the belly to belly and says, Yes, I have been training with Magnum TA. He has taught me the secrets of the belly to belly suplex. Then he starts talking about how someday he hopes to use it to beat, uh, to win the world title. He talks about Flair and he says, Ric Flair is the best wrestler in the world today. And man, it's a trip to hear Shane Douglas say that in 2018. Dude, it's not just that. It's like. He's been going after Ric Flair since 1988. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, where there's a will, there's a way. I suppose. He did eventually get his match. And then kept calling him out for years after that. That's right. Just never gave up. It was his gimmick. Hey, if you're going to call somebody out. That's true. Nobody, I should have started that in 1998. Nobody calls out Randy Hogan. No. 
I guess I've been calling out David Arquette. Does that count? I think so. Okay. Ric Flair versus Sting joined in progress. So the ref gets bumped. Sting immediately, immediately puts Flair in the shittiest scorpion of his entire career. Actually, you're missing a very important part here, Vinny. Mm. The referee got bumped because Sting came off the top with a high cross, and Sting gets a visual pinfall on Ric Flair. That's true, yes. He had him down for like 15 seconds. Yes. So the 45-minute draw is coming up very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously it's a very famous match, but why is the 45-minute draw so famous? Because it made Sting a star in one night. Exactly, because it proved that Sting could take the world champion to a 45-minute draw. Mm -hmm. That story is way better if we don't have Sting pinning Ric Flair in the ring here like a month before that happened. I couldn't believe they did this. I thought the whole point of the draw was he proved he's good enough to be Flair's equal. I just saw him beat Flair. Well, I think... You, if you were at home, would be savvy enough to know that Flair would be savvy enough to know the ref was down. And thus, why bother kicking out? Huh. Just can't catch your breath. I needed one of the three announcers to tell that story then. I might have helped. I might have helped somewhere along the way. So, yeah. Uh, Sting has a long pin. There is no ref. So then, Sting puts on the shittiest scorpion of his entire career. A second ref is there, but JJ yanks him out of the ring and then just kicks his ass. <laughs> Throws him into the post. He goes to pull Sting, uh, Sting off of Flair, but he can't do it. He calls his, calls for help. Arn Anderson runs out, but then Lex Luger and Barry Windham are there to run interference. Soon, a dozen other men in the ring, and somehow in all this chaos, Arn's able to break up the Scorpion and drag Flair outside, so there was no finish. And they go back to the studio, where Sting is there to cut a promo. Talks about how good it felt to put Nature Boy in the Scorpion. He's just trying to show Flair how to party right. He thought he did a good job, and he howls, and he cackles, and he leaves. He's wearing the most incredible 80s wraparound sunglasses. The, the, the Terminator sunglasses. This crazy, awesome, young guy, babyface wrestler promo is out of his mind. Running down Flair. He's happy. He's screaming. He's flexing. He's howling. Yeah. It was like, shouldn't you be mad that you just got fucked out of the title? <laughs> he's a glass half full person. <laughs> he he knows he won. He knows he can get the title late, later. Okay, he's, I guess he's on a roll. He was so happy to have not become champion. <laughs> like I say, glass half full. Sting was probably the best thing in this entire show, for sure. And I really wish there had been more of him. This promo was like fifteen seconds. Well, Vinny, that's what they want. I they want you to buy a ticket. To go see him. Okay, then how about this? I wish there was... Instead of... If I can't get more Sting, I would like less of everyone else. Well... The show was boring, my Ain't point. getting away with that. Ron Simmons versus David Isley. You think this was boring? It was long. It was boring. Let's <laughs> make sure we were on the same page. A long, like a bow and arrow hold, and a long Boston Crab, and a long bear hug, and then he got the win with a diving shoulder tackle. Larry Zabisco and Baby Doll cut a promo. That's really funny to watch this because it's the famous fucking envelope. Mm -hmm. And as we watch this boring show, this was like one of the only things on the show that was like an angle. Whereas you watch Raw, there's 80 of these on every Raw show. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's why this is so famous. But it sucks. It <laughs> She's got a fucking envelope with... Confidential written on it. Yeah. <laughs> and she says there's something in this envelope mm -hmm. that I'm holding over Dusty's head. We've seen it now on literally two shows. And it doesn't last much longer. There's no payoff. No. But 30 fucking years later, people are still talking about this damn envelope. So they just imply that whatever is in this envelope will, be, uh, will make Dusty's father or mother very proud. Larry talks about politicians. Sarcastically, they're saying this. Yeah. It will not make them proud. No. Well, they're they're happy about it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Larry says politicians who are caught having affairs have the decency to, res to resign. He asks where Dusty's pride and dignity are. Says it's time for him to resign. Doesn't matter how he was caught. He has been caught. It is time to face the consequences. I could have sworn that Baby Doll said nobody except her knows what's in the envelope, including Larry. Yes. But Larry seemed to know what was in the envelope. Also, yes. Yeah. So maybe she just told him, I have evidence that Dusty Rhodes has a mistress, but I shall not tell you who it is. I guess. And I shall not tell you what I have in this envelope. 
I presume that's what happened there. But there's a very important detail coming up later, but I'll wait till the Dusty promo to discuss it. Eddie Gilbert versus George South. They did absolutely nothing. The crowd was into it. But man, George South's mullet, his mullet was astonishing even by 80 standards. The, the highlight of the show was staying, and the second highlight was the fine collection of mullets. There were, there were a few. It was so glorious that it became part of the match where Eddie's like, ref, check my hair! The ref goes around, and then he pulls the mullet for heat. Mm. Because how could you not? How could you not want to run your fingers through that hair? Well, Eddie did. Sure did. Got a good handful of that hair. And he eventually won with a hot shot. It I was... got an inside, an inside tip for everybody out there. Mm-hmm. So, Buddy used to do the hair pull spot to me. So, just a little inside professional wrestling from the 80s. So, nowadays, you grab the person's hair and you yank it. And they go down. Right? <laughs> yeah. Back then, Buddy just made a fist... And he put on the back of the head, mm-hmm. and he told you to bump. Yeah. So he didn't even grab your hair. No. That's how light he was. You took a bump, and his hand went down because it was on the back of your head. I'm pretending to grab your hair. Yeah. It's not like I'm grabbing your hair and pretending to pull. I'm not even really grabbing your hair. It's like a magician. I'm trying to remember. You, you, you did that with Buddy, like, you know, every match, probably. I forget who you were working with afterwards. It may have been Nate. But someone, like, wrapped their fingers in your hair. You were yeah, trying like to steal a, a building. Hair mare. Yes. Dude. You were so pissed. It probably was Nate. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes came out for a promo. He plugged shows in New York and North Carolina and Virginia. Said he had made peace with Ole Anderson. Said Ole had the guts of many, many men. Called out the Horseman. Called out the Varsity Club. And he began to address Baby Doll. When who should show up but Baby Doll? She said he was going to face the consequences, or he would have to. Hand over the U.S. title. She, no, he has to hand over the U.S. Me. title. He would face consequences if he, if he refused to hand over the U.S. title. Yes. That's right. So she says her piece, and she immediately leaves. And Dusty kills the entire angle. You don't fucking say. <laughs> this whole thing was, they're blackmailing him with evidence he's done something very, very naughty. Dusty says, I once won Baby Doll for 30 days. That means 30 nights too. Go ahead, share what's in the envelope, and Larry, come face me like a man. Yes. Okay. In order to pull this storyline off, where Baby Doll has evidence, I'll, re- I'll say exactly what Larry said. She has evidence when a politician is discovered to have a mistress, they resign. Dusty, you need to resign. So, Larry believes he has a mistress, okay? Mm -hmm. The fucking mistress deal only works if we believe that Dusty Rhodes has a wife who he's very loyal to. Yes. Dusty, in his promo, admits, I won you for 30 days and 30 nights. Not even admits. Like, brags. Brags! And that's not even it. He's done this on TV before. Mm-hmm. When he's when he's in that mood where like flares all getting hot, and so he's like, "Well, all the women love me." Blah, blah. You want to see the women I'm with? So, if we know that Dusty is a philanderer, mm-hmm. my most hated word, how are we supposed to care about this envelope? That's a fine question. I couldn't believe my ears when he <laughs> threw that line out about I had you for thirty nights. Did you discuss that with your wife? Did you explain, it's just business, baby. It's 30 days and 30 nights. I must fuck her. I'm contractually obligated to make love to this woman. Yes. It's not cheating. It's Dude, business. This is so weird. <laughs> he says, Larry, if you want the title, come get it. You shouldn't send a woman to do a man's job. He's pushing every button. So, yeah, I, I guess we never talk about the envelope again now, because... He's made it May clear. as well not. He doesn't care. <laughs> I could not believe my ears. I mean, I kind of could, but like, even I couldn't. Even knowing all the stuff we talk about Dusty every week on this show, I still couldn't believe that he killed off the angle like that. <laughs> it's his angle! It's his angle. At least like Hunter would kill off everybody else's fucking angles. 
He didn't kill off his own. It's mind blowing. Larry Zabisco versus Trent Knight. I will write read everything I wrote down about this. Knight was a generic Magnum TA wannabe. They did some stuff, and Larry won with a neckbreaker. I added that I loved when Larry whipped out his karate. Hey, you got more out of this than I did. Every now and then he'd do like a karate kick. He, he'll open that in the, the karate stance. Yes. Extreme, with extreme side angle, yeah. Paul Jones and his crew cut a promo. They're on a roll. They won the bench press competition in their mind. Now they've won these six-man titles. Barbarian, by the way, late to this promo. Yeah, what was he doing? <laughs> He's out there. Jones is out there with Ivan and Warlord, and they're just granting. And about 20, 30 seconds in, Barbarian strides in, slams his belt on the podium, and just stands there because that's all he does. So Jones is running his mouth. My men beat the Road Warriors again. Road Warriors, you can be as mad as you want because you can't do anything about it. This is the only team that has manhandled you, wah wah He ran out of breath ranting. And so when he had no more breath left, he just blurted out a syllable and hoped that we pretended we knew what he was saying. We rewound it and rewound it and rewound it. And the best I can get is the team that manhandled you, wah wah Yes. When he passed away, we put him in the Hall of Awesome two days afterwards as a sign of respect. Yes. But you know what? If he hadn't died, I'd have put him in after this show here. <laughs> He's so awesome. So he says, my men are going to put Animal back in the hospital. We're going to take Hawk. We'll put him in the hospital. And we're going to put... Paul Ellering in the hospital. <laughs> now... <laughs> so bad. They left him... Mostly it's him. Mostly it's him. But they did let him wither on the vine out there. No one stepped in to nudge him or whisper. No. But but then he 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 realizes it's done. But he's all he's done. He says, "Ivan, take over." And so Ivan talks about how the Road Warriors aren't so bad. We've slapped them before, and soon if they're getting our way, we'll slap them again. And it's all done. And they're about to leave. And Jones, he's not even turning the camera. He just turns off in his space and shouts, "Road Warriors!" And he leaves. This was one of the best things in the show. It was. And you know, besides Paul Jones being awesome, one of the things that I loved about this was they're out there with their new world six-man tag team championship belts. They're so shiny and golden. <laughs> I remembered when I was a kid, these belts were the most important things in professional wrestling. Mm. Because I was a kid, I didn't know about gold plating. I thought these goddamn belts were made out of solid fucking gold. What in the world could be better than that? You win. A you get a giant belt made out of solid gold. They looked so awesome. They'd shine them all up, and the, the lights would be just like this, and so they're just shining into your eyes. Now all these stupid WWE belts, they've got the, the world championship that's mostly air. Who the fuck wants that? They got the tag belts that look like two fucking big pennies. They got that stupid... The other tag belts look like dimes. I'm like, who gives a shit about that? I want a big fucking gold coin. I don't want dimes and pennies. It's just like, the, 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 the best looking belt they have nowadays is the UK title for NXT. What's, what's happened to this business? Don't people understand the value of solid fucking gold? So the powers of pain and Ivan Kolov faced Mike Jackson and Steve Atkinson and the Red Raider for their, uh, well... I don't know if this is a title match or not, honestly. It's hard to tell sometimes. Fuck, I hope not. Steve Atkinson, this guy was wretched. And I'm being polite, okay? He's so white, he may have been an albino. He's whiter than a piece of paper. He's wearing a fucking bright red singlet. He looks like the Japanese flag out there. Was he the one who was, had, like, the, the, he had, like, they were, like, bike shorts. They can, like, half yes. the thigh, yes. They were bright, bright, bright red. They took one look at this guy. And they were like, we're going to just kill this guy. It's a six-man tag. Mm -hmm. Get Steve Adkison in here. They get this guy in here. They beat the shit out of him. All three of them. Nonstop for minutes on end. <laughs> they did not let him tag. No. They just beat him. There's a spot. I thought I was watching a fucking Ishii match. Barbarian gets in the ring. He hits him with the hardest lariat ever. And Adkinson, like, just... He doesn't even bump. He, he, he collapses. He just 
falls down yeah. to dead. Barbarian picks him right up. He whips him in. He he boots him in the fucking chin. He sure did. You see Atkinson's chin go, bah! and he takes a giant bump. And then as he's falling, Barbarian doesn't even wait for him to land on his back. As he's falling, Barbarian just drops his big fucking elbow like on whatever he can hit. <laughs> That's what I asked you. I said, are they trying to kill these guys? Yes. And I think they, they were. It was just him, as we later learned. And they beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him, and they threw him outside so Paul Jones could beat him. And they beat him, and they beat him. I was trying to figure out what the backstory was. It may just be that he, he, his look that he was, sucked. His look was so terrible, they just decided to kill him. And they eventually pinned him with the Russian hammer. Dude. Hey, say what? And then, not only that, Kolov hits... No, it's when the hammer was like the demolition thing or whatever. Whatever they hit him which, with. I, I lose track of which is which. They hit him with a move, and as soon as the ref counts a pin, Kolov starts punching him in the face <laughs> after the match. It's like, what did this fucking guy That's do? That's what I want to know. What's the backstory here? It I don't can't know. just be that he had a horrible appearance. No, lots, I don't know. I lots of guys have horrible appearances and don't get beaten like this. Now, here is the other final takeaway. I mean, Mike Jackson's talented. He's great. The Red Raider at least covered his entire body. Sure. Atkinson had no excuse. They for had this. to beat somebody? Yeah. Yeah. All I know is when this takeaway is done, I thought these men beat up the Road Warriors. These men had these great shiny gold belts, and these three men look like absolute monsters here. This was very effective at making me terrified of the powers of Pan and Ivan Koloff. This was a win. I should have made you watch Ishii and Ibushi. Kota Ibushi. What do you mean, made me? They had a far more violent match than Ishii had with Goto. Really? Oh, my God. You, It was actually, like, I would have a Goto-Ishii match with Ishii. Because he'd beat the hell out of me, but he wouldn't hurt me. I see. I'd wake up very sore, and I'd have marks all over me, but I wouldn't, like, have any serious injuries. Mm. Fucking Ishii and Ibushi, I can't believe they're walking. They landed on their heads. They were, they were punching each other in the fucking neck, slapping each other in the face. It was brutal. It was crazy. Maybe maybe Thursday. Dylan and Flair came out for a promo. So Flair's first point is that everyone else in this show comes out and does a promo, and all you, the fans, see is their bare, sweaty bodies. And here, JJ and I are in custom-made suits looking fine, finer than fine can be. Meanwhile, he's wearing a baseball cap. A trucker hat. Now, it turns out it's autographed. It's an autographed Lakers hat. I see. So that was, he, he tied the Lakers and Celtics into his promo, but it looks so weird to see Ric Flair out there in a suit and his gator shoes and a trucker cap. Yeah. So Dylan plugs the Starcade home video. He admits they have not yet found a counter to this scorpion leg lock. But he promises Flair's going to have Sting's number. Well, I hope he don't figure it out because Sting put it on wrong. That's true. Maybe, so, maybe it was a ruse by Sting. Yeah, if you figure out how to counter that one, wait till he puts it on right. <laughs> yes. So Flair starts to taunt some, uh, taunt some fans who have assigned for Luger. He explains that what the camera didn't show was that he had been tending to the referee, trying to make sure he was okay when Sting jumped him from behind and put on that hold illegally. Yeah. So he talks about Sting and Barry Windham and the Lakers and the Celtics and Dusty Rhodes. There's a handicap match coming up now. They did the tag match in the cage in Atlanta. Now it's going to be a handicap match in a cage in Atlanta with the three horsemen and J.J. Dillon versus Ole Anderson, Lex Luger, and Dusty Rhodes. And he talks about... He tells Lex to ask Dusty... What it's like to have doctors and nurses tending to your cuts at 3 a.m. Then he takes off the baseball cap. He gets to punch himself in the face. He busts open some scar tissue. Now he's bleeding everywhere. He's whacking his head. He's going, this is blood. I paid the price. I know what it's like. Like a madman. He was a lunatic. He's going nuts. And David Crockett is standing next to him like. He's holding the mic and he, he has to hold the mic, but he's. Nervous, who's like starts to lean but back. But he's he's happy. He's like, this is the coolest. Well, thing he I is ever also saw. happy. Yeah, he's yeah. he's punching his own head, and blood's coming out. So yes, Flair was extra crazy here. It was an awesome promo. Sure, absolutely. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard versus Tony Suber and Larry Stevens. Horsemen were giving mood for a little bit, as uh, Stevens and Suber got more offense than you think. There was a great spot where Suber and Arn, Arn Suber and Arn. 
Not Arm Anderson. Which, by the way, I had a new, I had a new character for you, Vinny. Arm Anderson? You need to get a partner for the new Rock and Roll Express, but you'll be Rookie Morton. Mm. So you can just be terrible. It's your first year. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway. I'm so proud of this. So, Suber and Arn try a body slam, but it gets mistimed. But Suber is so goddamn strong that he gives Arn a shoot body slam. Yeah. And Arn's literally like a 230-pound man. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. He's bigger than that, but yes. So, Horseman let him do some stuff for a while, and then cut them off, and eventually pin Stevens with his spine buster and slingshot suplex. And Simmons comes back up for a promo. <laughs> it's funny. Croc is doing the interviewing. And Crockett, of course, is a sadistic, sadistic man. He loves watching people get beat up. And he assumes that Simmons is in the same mindset. Yes, but he's wrong. He asks, do you enjoy beating people up like that? And Ron, like, blinks. Like, no, I'm not a psychopath. And he explains, I don't necessarily enjoy beating people up. This is the job we have chosen to do. I'm going to do this job as best as I can, and hopefully better than anyone else. But I'm not... <laughs> I love beating people up for fun. He congratulates Sting, says he will likely be winning the title soon, but if he does not, then he wants to throw his hat in the ring as a challenger to Ric Flair. says, Flair is the best champion the sport has ever seen, but I think that Sting has got his number. Mm -hmm. But if, if Flair can pull it off, I'm throwing my hat in that ring. Mm -hmm. Great, great babyface promo. He, he's sticking up for the, uh, the, 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 the ace of the company right now, Sting, but also letting it be known... He wants a shot as well. So Arn hears this, and he can't let this kind of insult slide. He calls Ron Simmons' boy several times to his face. Uh. Says he and Sting have no business challenging the horseman. Simmons does not take this well, as you can imagine. He says, says I'm not your boy or anybody else's. I'm nobody's boy. You got no business interrupting my airtime. He says, I'll let it slide this time, but if you try it again, you better bring a shotgun. And he walks off, and Arn is left flummoxed. Simmons was so... Awesome in this promo. He was so awesome. Arn's out there trying to intimidate this guy. He chose the wrong guy to try to intimidate. Yes. Simmons is just, he's gigantic. He's got that voice. Mm -hmm. And when he said, you better come out with a shotgun, I was like, aren't you just like leave the territory? <laughs> like go somewhere else. You're in deep shit now. Yeah, and, and Arn knew it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Arn knew realized he'd made a mistake. Lex Luger and Barry Windham versus Barry Colley and Cougar J. Colley could barely run the ropes. The Giants hit some drop kicks. The best part of this match is at the end. Windham gives Cougar J a headlock. And he starts pushing him into the ropes, and he's going to tag Lex. Lex is fucking asleep on the apron. So Windham has to push the guy into the ropes and put his hand out here for like, Lex! And finally, Lex wakes up, and he tags. And then they go to the finish. <laughs> so, Lex was asleep for the spot where he was supposed to get the tag to go to the finish. Yeah. So, once again, they go to do an interview. They're dry. One man, by the end of this, is sopping wet. So, this is the same deal that last week. Barry said one sentence, I think. He said he hoped to win the World Tag Team title soon. Lex, once again, just goes on and on and on and on and on and he was more water than solid at the end of this <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's like, disgusting <laughs> so, but it's not wrong no like every part of him is shiny and he ran into forever i was left laying in the if you would just say fucking less that's part of the problem. whole career might have been different part of the problem uh, why? he won't shut up yeah i mean that flare promo was so awesome but like when he was done, he was done. Yes. Why is this so hard to figure out? It did not go more than two minutes, that fair promo. This Luger say one. Say just as much as you need to say mm. and be done. And then shut the fuck up. Yeah, Lex just went forever. I was on the Matt and Omni. Now I'm standing here. I'm not in a cast. I'm not injured. I've got all my new friends. I will name all of them one at a, at a, at a, one at a time. And then I... I, I but <laughs> last thing I wrote here is he promised uh, something. I don't know what he promised. I was asleep. So then we had a really weird video. This was the weirdest thing ever. It's in Paul Bosch has been a uh, an icon in Houston wrestling for going back to the 1930s. Yes, when his career as a wrestler started. 
They have a video to announce he's being named to the NWA Board of Directors. So they go over his time as a as a wrestler, and then a broadcaster, a broadcaster doing wrestling radio because yep. TV was not around yet. Yep. Then he went into the war. They said this man is friends with Douglas MacArthur. And Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yes. Two men on the same level. <laughs> Simpatico. So, Bosch talks. And no, he... no, no. Now, before we get into this, this is the whole thing. They claim mm. Paul Bosch is the first non-promoter ever named to the NWA Board of Directors. That is what they said. Okay, so now before we even go further into this, Paul Bosch absolutely positively was a promoter. For Houston Wrestling forever. For a long ass time. So, when they said that, I was like, well, that's wrong. But maybe the idea was, you the fans, I guess, aren't supposed to know that he was a promoter. You're only supposed to think he was a broadcaster. Sure, okay. Like Vince McMahon. Yes, all right. And so now, you know, we decided that we're going to take this former wrestler who went into the war, got shot and forgot to duck a few times, as he said, and then became a broadcaster, we're going to randomly put this guy in the NWA Board of Directors. That's what they said. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Well, he talked about, he repeated basically everything they had just said, and then said, I have retired from promoting. <laughs> yes. He said, I've retired from promoting. So I thought, well, maybe I misheard them. Maybe they didn't say... The first non-promoter ever named to the board of directors. But then they go back to Jim Ross, who once again says, Paul Bosch, the first non-promoter like, ever placed onto the NWA board of directors. And as long as he just panned over and he talked, he did a separate voiceover for that, that they edited in. Maybe by non-promoter they mean retired promoter. He's not a oh, promoter the, Well, they right should have said second. that then. I'm, I'm, I just thought of that. And maybe that's so, what they meant, but... It made no sense. No, it was so, a good video. It was a nice little history package. Yeah, and, and he announced that he, at at the card in Houston on March March fourth, he will be uh, that will be his first day on the job, basically, uh, with the board of directors, and he'll be watching the world championship match very closely. Tully, Arn, and JJ come out for a promo. Tully was very short in the middle. Arn was very long at the end and really didn't say nothing. JJ was so awesome here. You know, I think it's time. I'm fine with it. I think it's time to induct J.J. Dillon into the Hall of Awesome. If only for this show, honestly. He, no, he's always awesome. He is, but this, 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 this performance is great. I'm going to let you talk about his main thing, but I'm going to tell you about the one little thing that he said, where I was just like, this man, this man must go into the Hall of Awesome. After he does his whole thing, Tully and Arn are doing their deal, and J.J. interrupts, and he says, you know, That's right. I have heard that Magnum T.A. is going to be there. And I have a message for him. Don't mess with me, especially the mood I'm in. I was like, this fucking guy is... is he is so great at his job. Yeah. His character is so cocky. But you know, it doesn't matter if Magnum just got in that car wreck and is laid up in the hospital, hooked up to a thousand machines. If he gets his hand on J.J., he's going to beat the fucking shit out of him. And J.J. is such a cocky bastard. All the time. He's so great at being J.J. Dillon. He's in the Hall of Awesome. J.J. Dillon. Official inductee today. Wanted to warn Magnum T.A. before the entire world, I am not afraid to put my hands on a, as J.J. would call him, a cripple. Yes. Yes. I will threaten this man. Now that's that that's like the aftermath. Yes. That's like the, the postscript of what had already been a great promo. They explain, once again, it's going to be Lex Luger, Dusty Rhodes, and Ole Anderson as a team against the Horsemen in Atlanta. And and, and whichever announcer it was repeats that. And JJ stands at the podium, he removes his eyeglasses, pulls them up the way. He like leans forward on the on the podium and just says let me get this straight. Not that long ago, he says, I was in a room with Lex Luger watching old horseman footage, and we watched ourselves attack Dusty Rhodes in a parking lot because that's the only kind of justice he understands. 
We slammed a car door on his hand. We hogtied him. We hogtied him. That's what he said. Yes. And we t- slammed a car door on his hand. And we laughed watching that footage. And I like to tell you, nobody laughed harder at that footage than Lex Luger. Oli, meanwhile, was part of that crew. He was the one attacking Dusty with a bat, tying his hand, slamming the door in his hand. Now, I am to believe that Lex Luger and Dusty Rhodes and Ole Anderson are going to be in a dressing room, getting ready to face the horsemen. I'd like to be in that room to hear what they have to say. <laughs> he was so good. He was better than Arn. He was better than Tully. He was better than Flair on this show. I thought he was better than Flair as well. Yeah. He was so good on this show. Tully just says that we're going to end their careers, and I don't even know what Arn said. He, he spoke a long time and had nothing of value to say. Ricky Santana versus Keith Steinborn. I don't need to see Ricky Santana and Shane Douglas doing the exact same match in the exact same show. Yeah, arm, it was boring. Arm bar, arm bar, arm bar, body press. They said it was a forearm, and I looked, and really it was a, a sloppy Who body gives press. gives a shit? Yeah. Ricky won. I thought it was the main event. I was wrong. The goddamn Jive Tones, Jive Tones. versus Alan Martin and Bob Riddle. Mm-hmm. What a match. Went like a minute. And the Tones won with the double leg sweep and cut a promo. Now, last week, as you recall, Shaska cut a fine promo and Tiger cut a horrible promo. And, and ran went, him over. And ran him over and threw him under the bus and it went forever. So they put him on last. Shaska goes first. He calls out Dusty Rhodes, runs him down. He calls out Ron Simmons, runs him down. And like, Everybody has to talk about Dusty Rhodes. Of course, of course. And then before Tiger even gets a chance to start, the music is already playing. The show's about to end. All Tiger has time to say is, we're looking forward to the Crockett Cup. And then it goes away. Yeah. They did it right this <laughs> they time. They did it. Hey, you know, when you make stupid mistakes, it's good to learn from them and not make them again. I suppose so. That's what they did. You know, going back, I liked the show a little more than I thought going in. It wasn't bad. Just nothing it happened. was just, it was not as exciting as, as NXT this week, for example. No, no, no. It was or not. the G1. It was that. <laughs> you make a strong point. Yeah. Their perspectives have been skewed. Yeah. But I. I... Well, let's get funky like a monkey. Let's, yeah. Let's begin. NWA World Championship Wrestling from February 28th, 1988. Vinny's jumping into this review as quickly as possible because he knows if he doesn't just get going. I'm going to start talking about Whole Foods mm. or the other terrible restaurant experiences that I've had over the last couple of days here. I'm going to try and contain myself. I'm going to try and just talk about this show. But if, if I get triggered, I just want everyone to know that there could be a there could be something unleashed here on the show. I'm trying to be a professional here tonight. There's I'm children actually, sleeping. I'm actually going as fast as I can to try to get out of this studio, which as usual is 100 degrees or more. Really? Why I'm is the actually- air not on? I don't know why the air's not on, but I'll tell you what else is not on is the lights. I'm doing the show in the dark. <laughs> why didn't you open the window while you were over there? I had the window open. Really? It's still hot in here. How hot is it out there? Like it what, was a, No, what's the temperature in Seattle? I hit 80-something degrees today. Oh. Yeah, it's hot. Hmm. You, know how to, you know how to operate the thermostat? I'm sure I could figure it out if I went downstairs. Yeah. and I'm uh, sure by the time the show was too over... Late now. It would be nice and comfortable. I see. Yeah, it's downright frigid out here on the beach. Mm. Yeah, it's in the 60s. Oh, my goodness, yeah. No, yeah. it's hot here. It's, uh, wow. it's hot and it's going to be hot again this week, so you may as well just stay down there. God, I should. All right, well, let's get going here. NWA World Championship Wrestling from February 28th, 1988. The clip that opened this show should just be like an evergreen clip that should open all shows. It perfectly sums up everything about this era. It's Dusty Rhodes in street clothes. Beating up all the horsemen by himself. <laughs> that is that is exactly what happened. And I look back now, I remember on one of the early days of Nitros, the horsemen had Benoit and Brian Pillman, and there was a scene where they were all trying to fight Hulk Hogan, and he beat them all up, and they were all begging for mercy, and the, the, the fledgling internet wrestling community was angry about all this. How dare this guy come in and make the horsemen look like geeks? Dusty Rhodes is doing the exact same thing ten years earlier. Oh, yeah. So... It's and people were ranting about it then. There's, th- these guys are lucky there was no Twitter then. That, that, oh my God. There was God, no social true. media. There was no, you literally had to write a letter to the studio, which Can was you imagine, ignored. Well, the, there's, there's fan interaction on social media. Can you imagine if Ric Flair had Instagram? Well, I mean, Ric Flair, there, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that Ric Flair would have been 
utilizing any of this, but I would like the, to the, the fans would have been utilizing it. That's my point. That is for sure. By the way, that was a big clip, and then I was waiting for them to talk about it more on the show, and they just never did. No, they never did. Uh, Dusty was, I thought he was supposed to be in a, well, I guess it's the future match in the Omni they're talking about. We'll get to it. This show, right off the bat, was immediately better than last week's show because it opened with a sheep herders promo. Yes. Well, first they plugged that coming up on the show tonight, we've got the Crockett Cup, which is coming up. It's going to be a two-day event. They're going to make some announcements about that. We're going to have a Lightning Express versus Sheep Herders match, which I was dreading going in, but I was happy going out because it was a good match. They announced that they've been all over the country. This has not been settled yet. Tonight is the night, they claimed, and they were wrong. And also, <laughs> a special interview with the Road Warrior Animal, the first interview he has given since his terrible injury. So the sheep herders come out here. They've come 12,000 miles to this country to win the U.S. Tag Team titles. <laughs> make, it or the like world. make it sound like they've come from the moon. To win the U.S. Tag Team titles, or the World Tag Team titles, or completely dominate Tag Team Wrestling. But they had a thorn in their side called the Lightning Express. And coming up shortly, we're going to show you bloody yanks that we can finish the Lightning Express for good. Already better than last week's show. It was great. Can you imagine the Lightning Express being a thorn in your side? Well, you gotta... I mean, yeah. <laughs> You can't just go out there and call them geeks when you're feuding with them. you got to say they're a thorn on the side. Sting versus John Savage. So, Sting does late late appearing. He comes running into the ring. I didn't mean running into the ring. He wins in 30 seconds with a scorpion, and one of his boots is all taped up. So I came to the conclusion that either his boot or just a, a boot lace broke like right before he went out there. So he was frantically backstage trying to tape this thing over to get out there and do something. Yeah, God, God forbid a boot like comes loose in your 30-second squash match where you have like three moves. Yes. So he noted that all the fans were going, ow! And Ric Flair went, woo! But Sting went, ow! That was like the whole promo. Yeah, he... Well, first off, John Savage, must mention, he actually was more shredded than Sting. Sting looked different this week. Yeah, he was kind of... I don't know what, I don't know what was, was going on. He was small. He he looked smaller than usual. Flatter, I think they say. That might be it too. Anyway, the 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 whole key to this promo to me was this week he actually cared that he should be champion. That happened, yes. If you recall last week, like the first interview he did after he'd gotten a visual pinfall over Ric Flair and then got screwed out of the title, he didn't mention one time that he was mad about it. And I was like, why doesn't Sting care? And then this week he did care. And he called the horsemen thugs. He lost his train of thought. <laughs> As he, he always does. Talked about Luger and Wyndham. He lost his train of thought again. And then he just goes, I'll see you after a while, David. I'll talk to you later, David, he says. <laughs> and he was out of there. <laughs> the friendliest guy. I'll talk to you later, David. I just love that he just was like, done. Like, yeah. I, I forgot my train of thought twice. Like, the third time, I'm just out of here. <laughs> so he left. I love Sting. Ricky Santana and Shane Douglas versus the Cruel Connection. Excuse me, did you say the Cruel Connection? The Cruel Connection, Brian. Huh. And all I can say is, if you don't take one look at the Cruel Connection, and you don't realize that we desperately need wrestlers like this in 2018, I don't know what to tell you. Well, the Cruel Connection were, in fact, I hate to spoil it for everybody, Gary Royal and George South, who I believe were also the executioners and and the uh, who were the uh, the gladiators and the gladiators. Yes. yes, they may not have actually been the executioners. They were the gladiators. They've got neon green bodysuits. Yes, gold trunks over the bodysuit. Yes, and white boots. And they put on these lime green costumes and went on national TV to convince people how cruel they were. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure they were better workers than Shane Douglas and Ricky Santana. I guarantee you they were more interesting. Yes. Than these armbar addicted 1980s baby faces. That's all they did. The Cruel Connection did other stuff, and eventually Douglas pinned a connector with the belly to belly. George South did an interview with Mid Atlantic Gateway, and he said Sometimes Dusty would have Gary Royal and I work three times in one TV taping as ourselves, as the Gladiators, and the Cruel Connection. Three different teams, but we'd only get paid once. 
Aha. So Crockett was saving money, but we actually loved it because we were on TV three times. One time they had us in two matches, one right after the other, as the Gladiators and the Cruel Connection. I was rushing to change outfits and about didn't make it. I screwed up. I had my lime green outfit on, but the blue Gladiator boots. Oops. Yeah. I can't wait for that. Then we had a hype video. They show a bunch of wrestling fans cheering, and you hear a deep baritone voice narrator. Tag teams are tag teams. But in the NWA, it's tag team excitement. It's fantastic. Stick, 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 stick. That was the whole video. <laughs> that it was, was it. phenomenal. <laughs> that was the whole it was video. So great. Had a Road Warrior Animal sit down promo. He explained he could not do his usual screaming promo because he had just undergone orbital bone surgery. That's right. You guys have probably never heard my real voice, he says. Yes, he had to go. He'd love to be out there screaming like normal, but he couldn't do it. Explained that his eye had sunken back into his skull, and to prepare him, they had to go up through his uh, palate, I guess, and also through his cheekbone to dig out his eyeball and fix everything. Sounds like the surgery was worse than the injury. That sounds significantly worse than the injury. I'd have just left the eyeball alone. Yeah, it's fine. He says, my eye socket was destroyed. My eyeball sunk back into my head almost a half inch, and doctors were afraid I'd lose my eyesight. Finally, he said, a road warrior had learned about pain. He promised that the powers of pain and Ivan Koloff and Paul Jones would all pay. And uh, I can see what they're going for here, and obviously he probably couldn't actually scream and yell, but this promo was missing something. Says he's never been hurt like this, he doesn't know how to act or feel, but he does know the pain that his partner suffered. Or he and his partner did suffer. He can't work out or do nothing, he said. That's right. Powers of pain and Paul Jones all going to pay. I, I actually believe for Road Warrior Animal that going without workouts would be worse than the threat of losing your sight. Basically, yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I guess not, because he actually got the surgery. He didn't choose working out over the surgery. I suppose that's true. I suppose that's true. Sheepherders versus Lightning Express. Goddamn, what a match. It was a very fun match. I couldn't help but notice that one team was much better than the other team, and you'll never guess which team I'm talking about. Vinny, let's be fair here. Mm -hmm. I hate the Lightning Express squash matches. They're just I... absolutely terrible. But getting in there and doing a competitive wrestling match as baby faces, working the sheep herders, they were actually great. They were Brad better. Armstrong in particular. Okay, I will, I will agree with that. Yes, everything, everything that people always said about Brad Armstrong, where I would hear it and then I would watch him do squash matches and I would say, what are you talking about? Boring, uncharismatic, nothing happened in lame matches. This guy was the most awesome babyface here in this match. He was so great. So the first several minutes of this, of course, the it was not a uh, totally one-sided affair, but every time the sheep herders got the advantage, they would soon be cut off and bumble into each other and bounce outside like fools. My favorite one was just Armstrong goes for a cover. I'm not sure what sheep herder was. It doesn't matter. The sheep herder comes in to stomp on Armstrong, but Armstrong dodges, and so the sheep herder stomps his partner. And they both get knocked out of the ring. Why does nobody ever do that anymore? I don't know, but my favorite spot was the baby faces are double teaming Luke and they knock him down. And they're both in the ring at the same time. Oh, this oh God. They both forgot who was the legal man. Yeah. So if you've ever been walking anywhere and you find that you <laughs> and somebody else are walking towards each other, and so you both try to walk and avoid each other, but by doing that, you both end up walking into each other? It's exactly what happened here. They both tried to cover and get off and cover and get off at the exact same time. It was so incredible. He's, I, I, was, <laughs> I was hating it for that. I also like the part Do where... Do you know how to avoid that, by the way, Vinny? How's that, Brian? You know how to avoid not having that incident where you and someone else are walking towards each other and you both go right, left, right, left, right, and run into each other? Just barrel on through? No. That's what I do. Don't look at him. I see. Yes. If you look at somebody when you're doing that, you will almost inevitably run into each other because subconsciously you're following each other's eyes. Uh -huh. But if you don't look at them, you actually won't run into each other. Try it. Well, that is just further evidence that 
Avoiding eye contact with people is always the best policy. That's right. The things you learn on this show, everybody. Yes. So I like in this match where the the Lightning Express have one of the sheep herders, and Tim Horner tags in, and he gets behind the sheep herder, and he hooks both arms, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and I think maybe the ref was legitimately not letting Armstrong double team or something, but nothing happens for a while. And so Tim says, fuck it, and he goes back to his default move, the arm drag. Now, eventually the sheep herders cut these guys off. Once the sheep herders cut them off, it was much better. Let's be honest. Sheep herders are awesome. He had a long, by the way, we didn't mention this, a very, very long match. It went, a, it went a long time, then had a commercial break, and it still went a long time, and never got boring, despite Tim Horner's best efforts. So Luke, early in the heat, I, I, I don't know if I can describe this accurately, but he goes to the middle rope and hits the funniest fist drop you ever saw. He gets up there, he's barking, he's shouting, his one eye is bulging out, he starts karate chopping the air, and he jumps off, and he hits a fist drop. And like 10 minutes of heat go by, and it's all great, and he goes up to the middle rope again, and he starts barking and karate chopping, the one eye is bulging out, and he jumps, and he telegraphed this move. And Armstrong says, hey, when he goes to the middle rope, and he chops and barks with his eye bulging out, he's doing a fist drop. So this time it missed. Made sense. So Horner gets the hot tag, and then things fell a bit apart, or at least it just got way too complicated. We had Horner and Luke bonking heads. They are both down. Horner has a cover, even though he's knocked out, for like a minute. He's on top of each other. And Johnny Ace has the ref, and Butch posts Brad, drops an elbow on Horner, also tries to do an illegal switch and make a cover, but the ref stops all this when he realizes it's not the legal man. And Listen, all we need to know is that Horner got the pin and Johnny Ace waffled him in the throat for the DQ. That is what eventually happened. Yes. That is the... Even that, let's not gloss over this Johnny Ace flag attack. Tim, Corner, Tim Horner does uh, the O'Connor roll. He reverse rolling uh, uh, cradle, you call it. Either, either way. So he's on top of the guy, but also doing a neck bridge. His throat is fully exposed. All Johnny Ace has to do is walk in there, and hit this guy in the neck area, and that's the end of the match. Johnny Ace hits the ring. He does a full circle around them like he's going to hit the ropes. Then he just stops, raises his flagpole high in the air, and then hits him. It's and all about drama, baby. Teddy Long had to pretend that he was not... Well, he had to not count. He had to not drop down and not count three just because there was a, an American pretending to be a New Zealander in the ring. Yeah. So anyway, it's a shot to the throat. It's a DQ. And that's that. Listen, I thought this match was great. I loved it. I love the sheep herders. The sheep herders are f- amazing. All that stuff about chopping, barking, and all that stuff that the sheep herders do. There was a spot earlier where they got sent outside, and, and like Butch is just on the floor doing that. That's how he sold getting knocked out of the ring. Yes, by, by being Butch. It's <laughs> just being Butch. By being Bushwhacker Butch. It's so great. I love them. <laughs> Thank God they're in the Hall of Awesome. They deserve it. They absolutely do. <laughs> so this next segment... I liked it, Vinny. They, it made it made the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup tournament seem like a big deal. They had a it press did? conference. Yeah, they had a, they had an official press conference. They went to a hotel. There were dudes there. There was they a microphone. Had, they had a podium and a microphone and a curtain. And Tony Schiavone says it is time to announce the location of the 1988 Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup Tag Team Tournament. And he announces. The event will be t- held over two days. Oh. Day one. It's like the G1 on- almost. Only not. Day one will be in Greenville, South Carolina, the southern portion of the Carolina Connection. And day two, where the finals will be in Greensboro, North Carolina, the northern part of the Carolina Connection. You know, so who- speaking of the G1, by the way, speaking of the G1, I got two matches you're going to watch on Thursday. I've heard that, uh, uh, let's see, it was uh, Omega and Ishii. Yes. Was unbelievable. And also Ibushi and uh, Naido. Yes. Uh, which I have, you know, that's those sound incredible. So well, we're going to watch them because people have been asking. Those those are going to be for potpourri on Thursday, which I, I hesitate to even say that because there's more matches coming up over the next couple of days. Yeah, and there's also progress that night. Oh, that's right. Uh, we'll figure it out. I'll figure something out. But yes, I I, uh, I 
you know, I, I don't question that these matches are well out of your are, are well worth going out of your way to see. There's no doubt in my mind about that. So, who do they have to hype up the Greenville and Greensboro events? But representatives of the arenas, not even like the mayor or city council members. Or something. No, just guys who work for and at the arena. Chip Gray. Yes, Chip Gray. And you know what? That is an appropriate last name for this fella. Of Greenville. Absolutely colorless, no personality, no charisma. And Jim Evans of the Greensboro Coliseum. And they both get up there. They're very excited to have the Crockett Cup in the Southern Connection, of the Carolina Connection. Here are some other fellows that work at the building. One guy is in marketing, one guy is in sales. Dude. We like harassing. When they mention the other guys that are in the room... For some reason, they've got to show a clip of all of them. But the clips were filmed earlier. And so they're editing in clips of these guys. And the guys are just like talking. Like they're talking over the... the it was so... <laughs> How could you have liked this? <laughs> it was, you know why, Vinny? Because I don't know why. It was... They're, they're, it, it seemed on like... On paper. If, if something real happened in this world... Okay, that's fair. You know, there'd be people out there talking about it. It's not like on WWE where Hunter and Steph come out to make some big stupid announcement. I mean, this this was like real people in the real world making a real announcement about something you know we're what? supposed no, to I, believe is real. I, I, I Listen, there's an arena thing going on in Seattle right now. It's trying to get an arena built for a long time. and I, So it's in the news all the time. All of these people are way more exciting than the individuals they had here from South Carolina. Well, North yeah. Carolina. Yeah, it's the 80s, you know. Yeah, he was on cocaine. I meetings. don't know what's going on for crying out loud. Let's move on. Midnight Express versus Curtis Thompson and Cody Starr. So Curtis Thompson, as we note noted have or have noted, he goes on to become Firebreaker Chip, which is a I don't think we've ever noticed that actually. Right, we, we have at least once. Maybe so years on become, ago. Yeah, he he goes on to become Firebreaker. He's interesting for a while. He's a large, muscular man. Cody Starr went on to perform at SeaWorld. <laughs> he's, he's a big flabby dude This big white whale Ill-fitting black singlet He looked like an orca I wrote down That this was like one of the all-time great disparities In physiques between tag team partners And as soon as I hit period I realized On this same program Dusty Rhodes teams with Nikita Koloff So I had to backtrack that, that a little bit But yes, one guy was big and muscular And one guy was big and fat Cornets on commentary list of things that would not fly on a wrestling program in 2018. He talks about doing a show in, uh, it was Houston or San Antonio, but he said all the fans in Texas are river swimmers. Oh, God. And they're always throwing rocks and bottles and tacos at us. Yeah. So, the Minute Express won with the rocket launcher. (laughs) The segment's about to end. And Jim Ross brings up the Fantastics. And he's Jim Ross. So he has to point out these two teams have a history together. But Cornette wants to kayfabe it and pretend they've never met before. So he claims, yes, I've seen pictures of these Fantastics. They're no match for my Midnight Express. They plugged, for the very first time, the very first Clash of the Champions. Wow, history's coming. There is a show, the highlights of which we will need to watch. All I know here is Cornette's doing this promo, and they put him behind... The Midnight Express. <laughs> They're leaning on the podium, paying not one word of attention to what Cornette is saying. They're scoping out presumably hot women in the crowd. They are very blatantly rating the talent in the crowd. They're whispering to each other, then they smile, then they point, then they cover their mouths and whisper to each other. And Cornette's in the background just ranting and raving about, fuck only knows, I'm not paying any <laughs> attention. I'm paying attention to the, to the stars here in the front. And I know he teased... Matches with the Warlord and Barbarian and Tully and Arn in yes. the Crockett Memorial Tournament because he says they're two teams we actually respect. Two strong teams. Yes, he, he listed all the teams they had beaten. Dusty and Magnum and the Rock and Roll Express and the Garvins and the Wyndhams and all these other teams. They're the two teams we have not yet beaten are the Powers of Pain of the Horsemen. Also teasing, you know, spoiler alert, there's a babyface turn coming by the end of the year because they cleaned out the division. They've beaten all the babyface tag teams. There's nothing else for them to do here. So, let's see. He added they would win the tag team tournament and the $1 million prize. And uh, I suppose that's it. 
Barry Windham and Lex Luger versus Gene Ligon and Rick Orasi. Remember last week you were saying that like there aren't any good jobbers anymore or something like that? You said something weird. I I, I, I recall that the bad jobbers had gotten better or something. Oh, man. Were you I was mistaken. Wrong. I, I, I was set, it setting was, my... It was building up on this show. I was setting myself up to look like a fool. <laughs> First, like earlier in the show, who did we have earlier? It was the fat guy. Um, Not Curtis Thompson. I mean, I thought there was one earlier, but I guess not. Yeah, so it started with uh, Cody Starr. Cody Starr, thank you. And then in this match, we had Rick Orassi. Just skinny, clueless, terrible mustache. I, I was on a tight schedule, but I, I almost watched this match twice just to study Rick Orassi. I will, I will say one thing about him that's not his fault. They showed him... The finish, obviously, is Barry Windham's Big Lariat. They showed a replay of this when it was over. He is whipped into the ropes by Barry so hard. Barry whips him into the ropes like it's a shoot. He's totally out of control. He bounces off the damn ropes, gets clotheslined to death, and pinned. I loved this. <laughs> Not as much as I loved the next match. Oh, we'll get to that next match. But I loved this match. But, but let's let, let's give this uh, this match the credit it deserves, or the scorn it deserves, I should say, for a. Uh, Mr. Orasi. Uh, the highlight for me here was, as you noted, this, this is not a very large man. This is not a Cody Star, for example. He's a skinny guy, and here comes big jacked up Lex Luger to press slam him. And Rick Orasi totally deadweights him, and Lex can't get him up and turns it into a backbreaker instead. And he stops, and he just looks at Barry like, what the fuck is this? So they beat him up. And they pinned him. And then it was time for Barry Windham and Lex Luger to cut a promo, and it is now officially funny. Barry Windham spoke for 17 seconds. And then Lex Luger spoke for 2 minutes and 33 seconds. Oh, my God. And as usual, he just had nothing to say. He just threw something out there, didn't make a point. Threw something out there, didn't make a point. Threw something out there, didn't make a point. The only thing of note he said was where after addressing all the tag titles and the Omni match and whatever, he says, I know Ric Flair is having a hard time with Sting. I am enjoying watching Ric Flair sweat. Yes. And I as he love says this, watching you sweat. As he said this, he's turning into water. He's melting like the Wicked Witch. You know what, Vinny? You know what's amazing about this? We've mentioned this for weeks now. But you know what was different this week? What was different this week is he was actually standing next to another man with no shirt on. Yeah. Barry Windham. And you know what Barry Windham didn't do? Barry Windham is bone dry. <laughs> Barry Windham didn't leak like a faucet. They both worked a match. They both were in the ring together. They both cut a promo. Granted, Luger rambled on forever, but the point is... Luger is standing next to this guy. Barry is getting drier under the hot lights as this goes on. And Lex is leaking fluid all over the place. And then, ironically, I love watching you sweat, he says to Ric Flair. I said. fucking died. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay. <laughs> Let's step back and take a deep breath. For there is much, much to say about Ronnie Garvin and Gorgeous Jimmy versus David Isley and Paul Lee. Okay. Was I mistaken? I didn't have time to go back and watch this a second time. Although I will when the show is over because I will no longer be on a time limit. Did Jimmy Garvin ever get in the ring? I didn't notice until I saw your tweet about this. But then I was like, I don't think he did. I don't think he got in the ring. for. <laughs> I, and if he did, it was like he got in and got out. Yeah. Ronnie Garvin, Ronnie Garvin on paper teamed with Jimmy Garvin mm -hmm. to face David Isley and Paul Lee. But in fact, Ronnie Garvin faced David Isley and Paul Lee by himself. And more specifically, Ronnie Garvin beat the shit out of David Isley. I don't know what this fucking guy did. I mean, when I watched it, there were a few things that I saw. But I can't tell if he got mad in the middle of the match or if he got mad before the match started. But he beat the shit 
out of this guy. He dropped him on his head with a crab. He, like, was going for a crab, and he just lifted him up and dropped him on his head. My favorite was, uh, he does a schoolboy, Garvin does. And Isley gets gets a shoulder up. And so rather than let go, Ronnie just hugs this leg like a tree. Yes. And hurks him into the air and power bombs him back down. That's the spot. <laughs> and then he drops him on his head with this move. And he goes to cover. And David Isley doesn't kick out. <laughs> so the ref has to hold up his count. And Ron Garvin has to basically kick out for him. And then Ronnie stands up and he looks at him with a look of such utter disgust. I've never seen a human look at another human being with as much disgust as Ronnie Garvin looked at this guy. I thought he was just going to kill him. But instead, he allowed Paul Lee to tag yeah. in. Instead, he killed Paul Lee. What did Paul Lee do? Besides, I guess, be born. Paul E. tags in. My exact words here are Garvin beat him to death in all caps. This was the Ron Garvin that should have been the NWA champion. There is no question of that. And and, and, and even more when he got the microphone later. When, when we were watching him two years before he won the belt, every now and then he'd do a match similar, similar, I say, to this. And I would say, why did everyone get upset when this guy won the title? He's fucking great. Well, as it turns out, when he won the title, much like Dean Ambrose, he didn't do jack shit as champion, and everyone couldn't wait for him to be done. If he would have won the title and come out and done this every single week, it would have worked. Oh, I yeah. guarantee it would have oh, worked. Well, there's no question. If he had been this Ronnie Garvin with the big gold belt, he might still be champion. He seriously, this seriously was like one of the ten best squashes I've ever seen. Maybe one of the five best. So he beats him, and he beats him, and he beats him. And he grabs him, and I don't think, like, he did the lifting DDT that, like, Edge does and Gangrel does, but between him doing it here and those guys doing it then, like, ten years went by and nobody did it, mainly because it looked so dangerous when he hit Paul Lee with it. He dropped him on his head. He lifted his entire body and dropped him on his head. So, poor Paul Lee, beaten, broken, lifeless, minding his own business lying on the mat, and Ronnie Garvin says, I'm going to slap this motherfucker in the face as hard as I can over and over and over and over and over again. Just beats him, then stomps him and pins him with a Garvin stomp. And if you told me that Paul Lee walked through that curtain, went to the hospital and then home, and then hung up his boots and never wrestled again, I'd believe you. I was going to say, if you had told me, I shouldn't laugh, but... He went to the hospital, he was discharged, he went home and died. <laughs> I worked too. I may well have believed it after this so match. So savage and brutal. <laughs> this was such a fucking beating. And keep in mind, I just watched those two G1 matches. I was going to ask you, Okay, <laughs> was, were those really scarier than this? Believe it or not, yes. Okay. Like, a lot more. <laughs> Which is hard to believe. It actually is. But... But, but if you take those two out of the equation, this was just <laughs> utter brutality. Uh, JJ and Ric Flair come out hyping up the show with the Omni. So JJ basically repeats what he said last week, only not as exciting. But uh, the other guys have all done terrible things to each other. Now they have to apologize, and I can't believe they'll be prepared for us. Then it's Flair's turn. First, Flair points to a specific woman in the crowd, and thankfully she was not shown on camera. He says, this woman is named Fatso. No one likes to be called Fatso, and you, woman, you need to keep your mouth shut until Dusty Rhodes comes out, and then you can go home with him. Keep that in mind, by the way. Yeah. He threatens to knock Magnum's teeth out if Magnum gets involved in the match the, the next day. Tells Magnum you need to find a chair to sit in and keep your mouth shut. Then he says, I have to be careful what I say about Lex Luger, or I'll be thrown off the air if I get carried away. And I thought, what did he say about Lex Luger? And then I remember the line where he said they were on the road with Luger making love to different women every night on the road. <laughs> oh, that was probably it. So he said he would be careful what he said about Luger, but after the match in the Omni, he would be pressing his ear to the wall to listen to the doctor stitching Luger shut. That was a great line. Yeah, he's Ric Flair. Yeah. No shit, he cut a great promo. Well, I know. And then he turns to Sting, 
He lists a bunch of cities they'd be working in and threatened to teach Sting a lesson. And then the Garvins returned. Did we mention that Ronnie Garvin on the show came off like the biggest star to end all stars? Dude, Jimmy said about as much in here as he worked at the match. Yes. And pretty much what he said was, my brother makes me very happy, and I'm sure he's glad he's on our side. <laughs> that is what he said. It's like, no shit. Yes. The, you didn't the, want to get in the ring with this guy tonight unless you were his partner? So Ronnie's point, his message here, he did call out Flair, said, I still got your number. But then said, something happened this week. We had a Garvin family meeting. Grandma was there, all the aunts and uncles, all the brothers and sisters and cousins. And we all decided we want the Midnight Express's U.S. Tag Team titles. And Jimmy here, he wants Mike Rotunda's TV title. He goes on for a while, and he was awesome. All Jimmy said was he's not paying attention to Kevin Sullivan's sick mind. He's coming for Rotundo's TV title. Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff versus Mike Jackson and Alan Martin and Joe Cruz. I was happy that a team called the Powers of Pain... Which is a funny name, by the way, when you really think about it. Powers of Pain. They actually didn't kill these jobbers. They just went in there and had a very athletic six-man squash match. And when it was over, they looked like these six-man tag team champions of the world. So, very, very effective. Barbarian especially was... I, I, I actually wrote here a killer of men. I can't really say that coming off that Garvin match. But he looked awesome. He's throwing bodies left and right and up and down, all very casually, all very easily. And Ivan is in there being a great old school wrestler. Barbarian is just coming in and doing clubbering forearms, whatever, or uh, Warlord is just doing clubbering forearms. Barbarian looked so great here. And Paul Jones, early on, he's, you know, he's, there's the usual, the usual awkward Paul Jones shouting at the camera when it's not on him stuff. And then after a while, he just starts chanting, pain, pain. Pain, pain, and he's louder. Pain, 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 and finally the powers of pain pinned Martin with a demolition style headbutt. This was a great squash. It was awesome, and I love this... the, I love the old style squash matches with the tags where the heels will kill some dude, and then they'll just let him tag out so they can just kill another dude. Yes, they're 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 bloodthirsty. My. This, this team is much better than I recall. I recall the Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff being two Road Warrior knockoffs and a short old guy. Incorrect. These guys are awesome. This is, this is a great team. I got to talk a little about this Paul Jones promo. So. <laughs> go ahead. I quoted the first part, but go ahead. <laughs> well, there's one thing I have to quote. He's, he's talking about his tears in his eyes. Hearing Animal do his promo. I'm going to try and do this like Paul Jones here. He goes. He's a man who has lost everything. He he is like he is like a bull who is castrated. Castrated, he says. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay, he's now completely lost. <laughs> okay, he has I... pictures. <laughs> he has photos, Vinny. Of the Road Warriors laid out at the bench press contest. He says, Could you have ever imagined all three of the Road Warriors laid out in the middle of the ring? I'm like, they're on the floor, you fucking idiot. Like, you can't <laughs> yes. even say that right. <laughs> See, that, that part I can forgive because that's like the heel boasting about something he didn't do, even though we have photographic evidence he didn't do it. So well, I can, sure. I, I can overlook that. But it was funny. It it's was Paul Jones. Now, I actually wrote down word for word the start of this, so I'm kind of repeating what you said, but I'm going to do it anyway. I watched the interview that Animal gave on television, and I had tears in my eyes because I actually seen a man lose everything he had. He was like a man, a bull, that's been castor-rated. 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 I hate when people do things like that because it's so funny, <laughs> and I repeat it so often that I end up saying it like that. <laughs> yes. 
So by the the good news is the last as as horrible as the first half of this promo was, the last half was that great. The Road Warriors are not the same team, he says. My men are the world's six man tag team champions. They are the world's strongest wrestlers, and anyone who faces them, you're gonna end up laid out on the floor too. Says he promised in nineteen eighty seven, and he made it happen in nineteen eighty eight. That's right. Because every guy comes out every January and they're talks about how this is going to be... Always talking about the date. Their year, or they're going to finally get this done. And Paul Jones is the one guy to actually follow up on it. Yeah. I wrote Awesomely Awesome, so I must have liked it a lot. It, it, it was awesome one way or another. Oh, yeah. It was awe-inspiring. This, I would rather watch Paul Jones a hundred times than any of those goofs from the Carolina arenas. Ron Simmons versus Ryan Wagner... I don't know what Ron was trying, a leapfrog or something, but he jumped up and did a double jumping knee strike to Ryan Wagner's face. Like a double V trigger. Yeah, weird things happen. I guess so. Then he did a bunch of abdominal stretches and a spine buster in one. Do you know in the Omega Ishii match, like less than a minute in, they totally fuck up a spot. Like, it, it's something simple, too. It's like, they're trying to do a drop down, and then Omega's going to do a leapfrog. But, like, Omega drops down, and he does a leapfrog, and he's, like, way too far away. And so he jumps up, and he jumps down, and Ishii kind of spears past him and stumbles into the ropes. Like, it's a total botch. And I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, God, they just botched a spot. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell? Like, it was weird, because, you know, you, you think, you know, when you see one of your the greatest matches you've ever seen, like, it's perfect. There's no yeah. botches in it. Yeah. I was fucking wrong about that. I learned my lesson. You can botch a spot. And still have a perfect and match. And still have, like, one of the ten greatest matches I've probably ever seen in my whole life. Uh, yeah. No, no, that's definitely true. Dusty Rhodes comes out for a promo. <laughs> he swears. This is basically what he says. I have never done anything wrong to tarnish the name of Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> That's what he said. That is pretty close to what he said. He challenged anyone with any photographs or any evidence that he had ever stepped over the bounds to step up and prove it. Okay, now I'm totally confused. This all began when Baby Doll presented Dusty with a secret envelope. And Dusty saw the contents of the secret envelope... And she told him, go do whatever you want with that. I have another copy. He was very upset, and he stormed off. Okay. If they're bluffing, if Larry Zabisco and Baby Doll are bluffing, then why was Dusty upset when he saw the envelope? If they're not bluffing, why is he daring them to show the evidence? And why don't they show the evidence? Well, Vinny, because this is a legendary shitty storyline. <laughs> this makes no sense. It's very bad. I know I'll probably ask these same questions every week until it drops. It's bad. Dusty says, I heard my partner Animal talking. Everyone should believe what he says. And then he got salty, talking about Ric Flair knocking his people. He says, I'm not a pretty sight either, but I can buy and sell you, Ric Flair. I'm a three-time world champion, the bull of the woods. And the baddest of them all. And he promises total destruction tomorrow night at the Omni. He says, if you're talking about fat women, I got a sister in Texas. <laughs> he says, I got to say something about my sister, he says. Yeah. She's 6'2", 250 pounds. I think it's 280. And if Ric Flair is talking about fat girls, well, he's talking about my sister. I was like, I hope he doesn't really have a sister. Because <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> so first... First, he says his sister is big and fat. He says she would beat Flair's ass. And then, like, in the same sentence, says that after a night with Flair, she, is, she would say, it was good, but not long enough, if you know what I mean. Yes. This is all over the place. Yeah, and then he vowed to get funky like a monkey. Yes. Hey, here's the deal, everybody. Dusty Rhodes as among the greatest delivery of anyone in wrestling history. He doesn't always make sense. His content here was bananas. <laughs> Excuse me, bananas? I bam. Yeah. Varsity Club versus Trent Knight and Gary Phelps. So we have talked about how 
silly it is that you've got the, the gimmick is is two college athletes and their devil worshiping manager. Yes, we are not enough talking about how their theme song is this happy marching band <laughs> to come out for the Satan worshiper and his two violent trained assassins who beat the hell out of people. The beating these dudes. Miami Dolphins legend Reggie Roby is shown in the crowd. Everyone made punting jokes. So they're beating these guys and beating them and beating them. And then maybe this is why I said bananas. It was a Freudian slip. Rick Steiner puts one of these guys in the banana splits and pins him. Yeah. Now, I, it looked like this was not supposed to be the finish, and the guy just forgot to kick out or chose to stay down because the ref counts three, and Rick still got him with his legs all splayed and looks around like that's it. And Maybe he, he got stuck. Let him go. Maybe he did get stuck. I got to so, talk about this promo very quickly here. Oh, we'll talk about it for a while. Well, I got. I just want to talk about the beginning of it. So you've got a devil worshiper, and you got two high-level college athletes who have just won a match, and they're standing behind him and they're celebrating, like they just won the NCAA finals or whatever. And meanwhile, Kevin Sullivan says. I was sailing the river of the dead. <laughs> I remember sitting down at the Hall of Memories with Jimmy Garvin. <laughs> like, what in the fuck? <laughs> Seriously, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> what is he talking eating, about? Something like eating beetles. <laughs> He's sailing the river of the dead? Yes. He has had good times with Jimmy Garvin from Bangkok to Bali Bali. <laughs> meanwhile. What? <laughs> meanwhile. Steiner and Bray Wyatt Sr. are dancing and smiling. And oh, this team They're rules. so happy they got a victory via pinfall yes. due to banana split. Yes. So they start talking finally, and Rotunda's got this evil grin. He was so bland as Mike Rotunda, Florida Heavyweight Champion, and as, as the psycho yuppie here in the varsity club, he's so awesome. I think, he says, I think we should take Jimmy Garvin. First, we'll give him a shave and a haircut. And then we'll take him down to Louisiana. And we'll see if he can pass the initiation. Maybe he's talking about the Wyatt compound. I presume that is the... Actually, well, I am, Yeah, that or the River of the Dead. I have no idea what he was talking about, but now I think about it, maybe this is where the Wyatt started. So Sullivan says... Somewhere in here, by the way, Sullivan said he had actually wanted Jimmy Garvin to join the varsity club. Which seems to defeat the gimmick. Because Jimmy Garvin has never bragged about going to school anywhere. But he says he's going to give Garvin one more chance. Don't listen to the poison, he says. Just That's say right. yes one time. And you know who that is. The precious. Poisonous. Precious for those of you who can't connect these dots. This is absolutely crazy. I still love this act. I love the Varsity Club. Hey, everyone remembers them. Yeah. Whatever they were doing great. worked. What's that? Whatever they were doing worked. I guess so. The Four Horsemen versus Tony Suber and Barry Colley. This match confused me for a while. I can explain this, Vinny. By the end, I, I got it. They gave Barry Colley a spot. They allowed him to do a bear hug on Tully. Barry Colley was pretty horrible, so you're wondering, well, why did they do this? So the whole point was to show that if something happens and Tully and Arn get in trouble, J.J. just jumps up on the apron, interferes, and they get their heat back and they win. I'm pretty sure that was the whole point of this match. There, there, there was that point. The other point was Barry Colley was big. He was a big fat guy. Tony Super was a big powerful guy. Super early on gets Tully in a headlock. And Tully can't get out, and he can't get out, and he can't get out. And finally, he suplexes his way free, but he still immediately goes to the corner and tags out. And the look on his face of shock, like, what is that? What is this strong man we're wrestling? Who is this guy? And then Kali is just big and fat, but uh, he also got blown up immediately. But he does this bear hug. And I'm watching big, fat, blown up Barry Kali get Tully Blanchard in a bear hug. And Tully can't get free. All he can do is reach for the corner and call Arn's name. But yes, as you noted, JJ took the ref, Arn cheated, they cut him off, and they hit the double gourd buster and won. So this all makes sense Well, I mean, right away. They cut a promo right away. Tully explains that, okay, this this was to show, A, that when they do get in trouble, Dylan will take the ref, they'll just cheat and get out of trouble right away. B, as he says, 
We just hit a double gourd buster on a 340-pounder. That's true. Collie or something. Now, Dusty Rhodes, when I see that program by your name, I see it says 280. So if we can hit that move on Collie and lay him out, we can sure as hell do it to you or Lex Luger or Obi Anderson. And Arn says it's inappropriate to plug just one local event on a global television show like this, but he's going to make an exception for this Omni show. Which is hysterical, because of course everyone does it all the time. Like all the other horsemen, he threatens to take out Magnum TA, and then he turned into Lex Luger. He just talked forever without anything new to say. Just repeated the same points over and over for a while. Max MacGyver versus Larry Zabisco with Baby Doll and her mom jeans. Oh man, that's the first thing I thought too. <laughs> She's standing Look there. Look at she, those mom jeans. She her back's to the camera. She got jeans pulled up to her boobs. They're tucked into cowboy boots, snakeskin boots, in fact. And she, she it's, like I say, she's right there. You can't not see it. I gotta say something about this match here. This Max MacGyver was getting a championship match against Larry Zabisco. Max MacGyver. I've ranted about this guy for weeks now on this show. He sucks. But you know what? We watched David Flair on mm. Nitro. And after watching David Flair on Nitro, I watched Max MacGyver here. I said to myself, is this man worse than David Flair? And upon saying that and watching the match, it suddenly struck me, Max MacGyver was fine. Now, he sucked, but I mean, compared to David Flair, he was a perfectly competent professional wrestler. He got in there, he took some moves, like he could get up, he could sell his guts, and then he laid down and was pinned. Way better than David. Actually, the only guy who blew a spot here was Teddy Long. Because Larry hit a move, I forget what it was, it doesn't matter. He makes a cover, and he looks around and there's no Teddy. And Teddy finally runs over and starts to count, and Max Mike ever kicks out. And Larry shouts at Teddy, where were you? And Teddy says, I was dealing with Baby Doll. And so Larry hits his neck breaker and wins. And then they cut a promo. So it's all about the same Dusty Rhodes secret envelope. And so I'm just baffled. I'm trying to make sense of it all. I'm barely even noticing that Larry's promo is fantastic. Oh, yeah, he's great. It's such a great promo. I only got one line written down. Where he says, Dusty Rhodes, you have no pride. You have no integrity. You have no dignity. You are the American dream. That made me laugh. And he is ranting about paying the consequences as the show goes off the air. Oh, I mean, you're not even doing it justice. So he mentions Jimmy Swaggart stepping down. I was like, my God, this show is old. Holy shit, this is an old show. Says Dusty needs to be an example, like Jimmy Swaggart, he says. He wants to know if he's going to step down because of these allegations, and if he's going to admit it like Jimmy Swaggart had the guts to do, or if he's going to continue to be a snake. He says, I'm not going to come out here and tell the kids that Santa isn't real, or the Easter Bunny isn't real, but I am going to tell them Dusty Rhodes is a coward. He starts screaming, if you did it, admit it. If you did it, admit it. He's screaming, and they literally go off the air in the middle of him screaming. This was a great promo. Larry's awesome. Larry's out of this world fantastic. Yeah, he's, he was ruined by his Nitro stint where he was just really annoying on commentary and a know-it-all. But, like, he was very good in the ring, very good promo. And we're watching his, his Crockett stuff. We're not even watching all the AWA stuff. Maybe that'll be next. So, yeah, there you go. That was a show. I just remembered 